Introduction to Sacred Meditations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonathan Lang Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt Translated by C. W. Heisler Introduction a new translation of the admirable devotional manual of John Gerhard needs no apology. The Meditationes Sacrae was first published in Latin in the year 1606, when the author was but twenty-two years old. It enjoys the singular distinction of being the only work written by a young man that gained and maintained a deep and lasting hold upon the Church, as so expressing the loftiest devotion, with spiritual insight so just that all, even those old in the faith, might be guided and uplifted by the meditations of so young a disciple of Christ. It has been frequently reprinted in Latin. It was speedily translated into German, and later into most of the European languages, including the Greek. It has also been honored with an Arabic version. The English translation by R. Witherton, 1631, passed through at least nineteen editions, it ranks in its fine devotional spirit with Thomas a Kempis, Imitation of Christ, Arndt's Das Veris Christentum, and Taylor's Holy Living and Dying. It is not a large book, but a golden one. John Gerhardt was born of a good family in Quedlinburg, 17th of October, 1582. In his fifteenth year, during a dangerous illness that continued about a year, he came under the personal influence of John Arndt, and resolved to study for the ministry. In 1599 he entered the University of Wittenberg. During his studies he relinquished his purpose and gave himself for two years to the study of medicine. But in 1603 he resumed his reading of theology at Jena. On the completion of his course he began to give lectures at Jena in 1605. In 1606 the same year in which the Meditationes Sacrae appeared, he accepted the Duke of Coburg's invitation to a professorship in the Coburg Gymnasium and to the superintendency of Heldberg. In 1616 he became professor at the University of Jena, which position he retained until his death. Though still comparatively young, Gerhard had already come to be regarded as the greatest living theologian of Protestant Germany. In the numerous disputations which characterized that period, he was always protagonist, while on all public and domestic questions touching on religion or morals, his advice was eagerly sought on all hands and by every class. Almost every university in Germany called him, as well as the University of Uppsala in Sweden, but in vain. His writings indicate enormous labor, being both voluminous and varied, dealing alike with exegetical, polemical, dogmatic, and practical theology. All exhibit patient study, great grasp of intellect, copious knowledge, and religious experience. Luthart says, as a theologian, he combined rare learning, great acuteness, wonderful industry, sound judgment, and practical ability with ardent piety. His great work, the Loki Theologici, begun in 1610 and completed in 1621, in which the theology of the Lutheran Church is set forth, is his theological masterpiece, and is marked by fullness of learning, logical force, clearness, thorough elaboration of every question, and by a practical and spiritual use of dogma. Bossuet is said to be the author of the often quoted remark that Gerhard is the third, Luther Chemnitz Gerhard, in that series of Lutheran theologians in which there is no fourth. Gerhard died on the 20th of August, 1637. Of him it is recorded that personally he combined all the excellencies of the Christian character, his only failing, if it be a failing, being in excessive love of peace. The meditations amply substantiate his fervent piety, his deep spiritual insight, which could only be acquired by living communion with the Lord. The work of translation of this volume was entrusted to Rev. Charles W. Heisler, A.M., who has lovingly and faithfully performed his task, which to him was a congenial and pleasant labor. 
The age in which we live is practical and energetic, more given to work than meditation. It needs the corrective which such books supply, teaching that there is a spiritual greatness which can only be attained by meditation and prayer. It is well to work, but the highest work can only come from the greatest souls who are nurtured by fellowship with God. It is therefore sent forth, with the hope that its pages will furnish to many a help to higher and deeper fellowship with the Master, to their unspeakable comfort and larger efficiency as laborers with him in his kingdom. Charles S. Albert End of the Introduction Meditation 1 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt Translated by C. W. Heisler this Lieberbach recording is in the public domain. True Confession of Sin Holy God, Thou just judge, my sins are ever before Thine eyes and present to Thy thought. Every hour do I think of death, for every hour death threatens me. Every day do I think of the judgment, because for every day I must give an account at the day of judgment. I examine my life, and lo, it is altogether vain and wicked. Vain and unprofitable are many of my actions. Vainer still are very many of my words, whilst full of vanity are the most of my thoughts. Nor is my life only vanity, it is also unholy and wicked. Nothing good do I find in it. Even if I should find in it anything apparently good, yet it is not really good and perfect, because tainted with original sin and a corrupt nature. The godly Job said, I am afraid of all my works. And if so pious a saint thus complains, what must I, a miserable sinner, say of myself? All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. If such be our righteousness, what then shall be our unrighteousness? When ye shall have done, said the Saviour, all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. If we are unprofitable when we obey, surely we shall be abominable when we transgress his commandments. If I owe thee, O holy God, myself, and all I can do when I commit no sin, what can I possibly render thee when I sin? Our righteousness, however excellent it seems to us, compared with thine is naught but unrighteousness. A lamp that gleams in the darkness is obscured in the light of the sun. Often a stick is supposed to be straight, until, compared with a rule, its crookedness appears. Frequently, the impression of a seal appears perfect to the ordinary beholder, whilst the eyes of the artificer will discover many defects. And thus often a deed that glows in the opinion of the doer appears mean in the thought of the judge. For the judgments of men are one thing, the judgments of God another. The remembrance of my many sins terrifies me, but, oh, how many more escape my memory! Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults, O Lord! To heaven I dare not lift up my eyes, because I have offended him who dwelleth in the heavens. Nor can I find any refuge upon earth, for how dare I hope for any favour from the creature, since I have offended the Lord of all creatures? My adversary the devil accuses me. Thou righteous judge, says he to God, adjudge him mine on account of his sin, who would not be thine through the offer of thy grace. Thine he is by nature, mine by his willful delight in sin. Thine he is through thy passion, mine through my persuasion. Disobedient to thee, he has been obedient to me. From thee he received the robe of immortality and innocence. From me he has received these tattered garments of unrighteousness. Thy robe he has lost, in mine he comes to thee. Adjudge him then to be mine, and condemn him to share my eternal damnation. All the elements rise in judgment against me. The heavens cry out, I have comforted thee with light. The air exclaims, I have given thee every variety of birds for thy pleasure. The water says, I have given thee every kind of fish for thy sustenance. The earth declares, I have supplied thee with bread and wine for thy nourishment. 
yet hast thou abused all these things, and hast brought our common Creator into contempt. Let all our blessings, therefore, be turned into instruments to torture thee. The fire cries out, Let him be burnt in me. The water says, Let him be drowned in me. The air calls out, Let him be tossed and driven by my tempests. The earth exclaims, Let him be swallowed up by me. The fire again says, Let my flames devour him. The holy angels whom God has given to be my ministering spirits and my companions in the future life accuse me also. And alas, by my sins I have deprived myself of their holy ministry in this life, and of the blessed hope of their fellowship in the life that is to come. The very voice of God, the divine law, is also my accuser. That law I must either keep or perish. But for me to fulfill that law is plainly impossible, and the thought of perishing is absolutely intolerable. And God, the inflexible judge, the almighty executor of his own external law, accuses me. Him I cannot deceive, for he is wisdom itself. From him I cannot flee, for everywhere his power reigneth. Whither then shall I flee? To thee, O blessed Christ, my only Redeemer and Saviour, do I fly for refuge. Great indeed are my sins, but greater far is the satisfaction thou hast made for them. Great is my unrighteousness, but greater far is thy righteousness. I admit my sin, O oh, do thou graciously remit its penalty. I reveal it, do thou mercifully conceal it. I penitently uncover it, do thou graciously hide it. In me there is nothing but sin that deserves thy condemnation. In thee there is nothing but grace that affords me a blessed hope of salvation. I have committed many sins, for which I could be most justly condemned. But thou hast omitted nothing that thou mightest most graciously save me. I hear a voice in canticles, which bids me hide in the clefts of the rock. Thou art the immovable rock and thy wounds its clefts. In them I will hide me against the accusations of the whole world. My sins cry aloud to heaven for vengeance, but still more strongly cries out thy blood shed for my sins. My sins mightily accuse me before God, but thy passion is mightier for my defense. My dreadfully wicked life clamors for my condemnation, but thy holy and righteous life pleads more powerfully still for my salvation. I appeal from the throne of thy justice to the throne of thy mercy, nor do I desire to come before thy judgment bar, unless thy most holy merit interpose between me and thy judgment. End of Meditation 1《Sacred Meditations》by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Exercise of Repentance from Our Lord's Passion Behold the suffering Christ. Behold, O faithful soul, the grief of thy Lord upon the cross, his gaping wounds as he hangs there, and the awful agony of his death. That head before which the angelic spirits bow in reverential fear, is pierced with crowded thorns. That face, beautiful above the sons of men, is defiled by the spit of the ungodly. Those eyes, more luminous than the sun, darken in death. Those ears, accustomed to the praises of the angelic hosts, are greeted with the insults and taunts of sinners. That mouth, which spake as never man spake, and teaches the angels, is made to drink the vinegar and the gall. Those feet, at whose footstool the profoundest adoration is paid, are pierced with nails. Those hands which have stretched out the heavens are extended upon the cross and fastened with spikes. That body, the most sacred abode and the purest habitation of the Godhead, is scourged and pierced with a spear nor did aught in it remain uninjured but his tongue, that he might pray for those who crucified him. He who rules in heaven with the Father 
is most shamefully abused upon the cross by sinners. God suffers. God sheds his blood. From the greatness of the price paid, judge of the greatness of thy peril, and from the cost of the remedy, judge the dreadfulness of thy disease. Great indeed were thy wounds of sin, which could be healed only by the wounds of the living and life-giving flesh of the Son of God. Desperate indeed was that disease which could be cured only by the death of the physician himself. Consider, O faithful soul, the blazing wrath of God. After the fall of our first parent, the eternal, only begotten, and well-beloved Son of God himself became our intercessor. And yet God's wrath was not turned away from us. He by whom God made the worlds was interceding for us, and for the sake of us miserable sinners, he, the Most High, became the advocate of our salvation. And yet for all this was God's wrath not turned away from us. The Savior clothes himself in our flesh, that the divine glory being communicated to our flesh, he might make an atonement for sinful flesh, and that the healing power of perfect righteousness being communicated to our flesh, he might thus purge out the poison of sin inhering in our flesh. And yet, despite all this, God's wrath was not turned away from us. He takes upon himself our sins and their just deserts. His precious body is bound, scourged, wounded, pierced, crucified, and laid in the sepulchre. His blood starts forth profusely like the dew from all parts of his suffering body. His most holy soul is saddened beyond measure, and became sorrowful even unto death. He is subjected to the very pains of hell, and the eternal Son of God cries out in horror that he is forsaken of God. He sweats such great drops as of blood, and such anguish does he suffer as to need the comfort of an angel, who himself comforts all angels. He dies, who is the giver of life to all. If this be done in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry? If this be done to the just and holy one, what shall be done to sinners? If God so punish our sins in the person of his only Son, how shall he punish them in us? How shall God continually tolerate in a servant that which he punished so severely in his own Son? What shall those whom he condemns suffer if his only Son, whom he so dearly loves, suffered so much? If Christ, who came into the world without sin, could not depart from it without the bitter scourging, of how much sorer punishment shall they be deemed worthy who are born in sin, who live in sin, who die in sin? The servant rejoices, while for his sin the well-beloved son is grievously afflicted. The servant treasures up against himself the wrath of God, while the son strenuously labors to soften and appease the father's anger. O oh, the infinite wrath of God! O oh, his unutterable indignation! O oh, the inconceivable rigor of divine justice! If God visits his holy indignation upon his only begotten and well-beloved son, the partaker of his own divine nature, not because of any sin of his own, but because he had taken the miserable servant's place, what, think you, will he do to the servant, who so confidently persists in his sins and offenses? Let the servant fear and tremble and deeply sorrow at the thought of his own just deserts, since the blessed son is so punished for no fault of his own. Let the servant fear, who ceases not to sin, while the Son so agonizes for sin. Let the creature fear, who has crucified his Creator. Let the servant fear, who has slain his Lord. Let the ungodly and the sinner be afraid, who has so afflicted the Holy and Righteous One. Let us hear our Saviour, O my beloved, crying aloud to us. Let us give heed to him as he sheds bitter tears for our sakes. From the cross he cries, Behold, O sinful man, what I am suffering for thee. To thee I cry, because for thee I am dying. Behold the punishment inflicted upon me. Behold the nails which pierce me. There is no grief like unto my grief. And yet, though my outward sufferings are so great, far greater is the agony of my heart, because I am finding thee so ungrateful. Have mercy upon us. 
have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O thou only God of mercy, and turn our stony hearts to thee. End of Meditation 2「Meditation Three of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Benefits of True Repentance Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, says Christ. The very foundation and principle of a holy life is godly sorrow for sin. For where there is true penitence, there is forgiveness of sins. Where there is forgiveness of sin, there is the grace of God. Where the grace of God is, there is Christ. Where Christ is, there is Christ's merit. Where Christ's merit is, there is satisfaction for sin. Where there is satisfaction, there is justification. Where there is justification, there is a glad and quiet conscience. Where there is peace of conscience, there is the Holy Spirit. Where the Holy Spirit is present, there is the ever-blessed Trinity. And where the Holy Trinity is, there is life eternal. Therefore, where there is true penitence, there is life eternal. And hence, where there is no true penitence, there is neither forgiveness of sins, nor the grace of God, nor Christ, nor His merit, nor satisfaction for sin, nor justification, nor peace of conscience, nor the Holy Spirit, nor the Blessed Trinity, nor eternal life. Why, therefore, do we delay repentance? Why put it off until tomorrow? Neither tomorrow nor true repentance is in our own power. For we must render an account at the final judgment, not only for tomorrow, but for today as well. That tomorrow shall come is not certain but that everlasting destruction shall overtake the impenitent is certain. God has promised grace to the penitent soul, but he does not promise a tomorrow. Christ's satisfaction is of no effect but in the heart of the truly contrite. Our iniquities separate between God and us, writes the prophet Isaiah, but through repentance we are again restored to his favor. Confess and bewail the guilt of thy sin, so shalt thou realize that God is reconciled to thee in Christ. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, says the Lord. Our sins were therefore recorded in the court of heaven. Hide thy face from my sins, prays the prophet. The Lord hath set our iniquities before him. Return unto us, O Lord, was the prayer of Moses. Thus our sins separate us from God. Our sins testify against us, complains the prophet Isaiah. They accuse us, therefore, at the bar of divine justice. Cleanse me from my sin, pleads David. And thus, sin is revealed as a foul defilement in the sight of God. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Again he prays. And thus, sin is a disease of the soul. Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book, saith the Lord. Therefore, on account of our sins, we shall be blotted out of the book of life. Cast me not away from thy presence, was the psalmist's earnest prayer. Thus, for our sins, God casts us off. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Therefore, by sin, we drive the Holy Spirit of God from the temple of our hearts just as bees are driven away by smoke, and doves by a foul odor. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Therefore sin brings anguish of soul, and wastes the very powers of our hearts. The earth also is defiled unto the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, exclaimed the prophet Isaiah. Therefore sin is a sort of infectious poison, out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord, says the psalmist. Hence, by our sins we are cast down even to hell. Formerly we were dead in trespasses and sins, according to the apostle. Therefore sin is a spiritual death to the soul. Through mortal sin man loses God. God is the infinite and incomprehensible good. To lose God is therefore an infinite and incomprehensible calamity. 
As God is the greatest good, so sin is the greatest evil. Punishments and afflictions are not real evils, because much good may come out of them. On the other hand, we should esteem them good, because they come from God the highest good, from whom naught but good can come. Christ himself, the highest good, suffers such afflictions, and he could not be a partaker of what was really evil. They lead also to the highest good, that is, eternal life. Through suffering Christ entered into his glory, and through much tribulation must we Christians enter into eternal life. Sin is the greatest evil because it draws us away from the highest good. The nearer we approach God, the farther we get away from sin. The nearer we come to sin, the farther we withdraw from God. How salutary, then, is true repentance, which releases us from sin and leads us back to God. Sin is so exceeding sinful because of the greatness of God, whom we offend by our sin. And so great is He, that the heavens and the earth cannot contain Him. And, on the other hand, our repentance is so great, because of the greatness of Him to whom, through our repentance, we return. The sinner's conscience, which he has defiled through sin, the Creator, whom he has offended, the very fault by which he transgressed, the blessings which he has thus abused, and the devil at whose impulse it was committed, all unite in accusations against him. How blessed is repentance which frees him from such an accusation! Let us make haste, then, let us make haste to employ this sovereign remedy for our sinful malady. If thou shouldst repent, even in the hour of death, thou wouldst not so much forsake thy sins, as thy sins would forsake thee. Thou wilt scarcely find one who has truly repented in the hour of death, except indeed the thief upon the cross. Fourteen years have I served thee, said Jacob to Laban. It is time now that I provide for mine own house. And thou, if thou hadst been so careful for thy life in this world for so many years, is it not reasonable and proper that thou shouldest now begin to provide for thine immortal soul? Day by day our fleshly nature leads us into new sins. Let the Holy Spirit then wash them away by our daily sorrow and repentance. Christ died that sin might die in us. And can we willingly let it live and reign in our hearts, since the Son of God himself gave up his life to destroy its power in us? Christ does not enter the heart of a man unless a John the Baptist first prepare the way for him by repentance. God does not pour the oil of his mercy, except into the vessel of the truly contrite heart. God first puts the soul to death, as it were, through contrition, that he may afterwards quicken it through the consolation of the Holy Spirit. He casts it down to hell in godly sorrow for sin, that he may bring it up again by the blessed power of his grace. Elijah first heard the great and strong wind rending the mountains, and breaking in pieces the rocks, and after the wind an earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, and at length the still small voice. Thus the terror of the law precedes the sweetness of divine love, and sorrow for sin, the consolation of the Spirit. God does not bind up thy wounds until thou acknowledge and deplore thy sin. God does not cover thine iniquities until thou first uncover them in humble penitence. He forgives them not until thou hast confessed them. He does not justify thee until thou hast first condemned thyself. And he does not afford his rich consolations, until thou hast first despaired of help in thyself. May God work true repentance in us through his Holy Spirit. End of Meditation 3。Meditation 4 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Name of Jesus What can be sweeter than the name of Jesus? O blessed Jesus, be thou indeed a Jesus to me. For thy holy name's sake have compassion upon me. My life condemns me, but the name of Jesus will save me. 
for thy name's sake deal with me according to thy name and since thou art a true and great saviour thou wilt surely regard with mercy those who are real and great sinners have mercy upon me o blessed jesus in the day of mercy so as not to condemn me in the day of judgment if thou wilt receive me within the bosom of thy compassion thou wilt not on my account be the more straitened if thou wilt bestow upon me some crumbs of thy goodness thou wilt not on that account be poor for me thou art born for me thou art circumcised to me also thou art jesus for what is jesus but saviour and what real harm can befall the saved what beyond salvation can we either seek or expect receive me o lord jesus into the number of thy children so that with them i may praise thy holy and saving name if through my sin i have lost my original innocence have i deprived thee of thy mercy if i have miserably destroyed and condemned myself yet canst thou not compassionately save me do not so regard my sins o lord as to forget thine own mercy do not so weigh and measure my offences that they may outweigh thy merit do not so consider my evil as to overlook thine own good remember not wrath against the culprit but be mindful of thy mercy towards a miserable sinner wilt not thou o christ who hast given me a desire for thee fulfil my longing desire wilt thou who hast shown me my unworthiness and just condemnation conceal from me thy merit and the promise of eternal life before a heavenly tribunal my cause must be tried but it comforts me that in the heavenly court the name of saviour has been given thee for that blessed name was brought from heaven by the angel o most merciful jesus to whom wilt thou be a jesus if not to wretched sinners seeking grace and salvation those who trust in their own righteousness and holiness seek salvation in themselves but i who find in me nothing worthy of eternal life flee to thee as my saviour save me for i am condemned have mercy upon me for i am a sinner justify me for i am unrighteous acquit me for i am under accusation of sin thou o lord art the truth thy name is holy and true therefore let thy name be true in respect to me be thou my jesus and my saviour be thou my jesus in the present life be thou my jesus in death be thou my jesus in the last judgment be thou my jesus in eternal life and assuredly thou wilt be o blessed jesus because as thou art unchangeable in essence so wilt thou be in mercy thy name will not be changed o lord jesus on account of one miserable sinner like me nay but thou wilt be a saviour even to me for thou wilt not cast out any one that cometh unto thee thou hast given me the desire to come to thee and surely thou wilt receive me when i do come for thy words are truth and life what if the propagation of original sin in me condemns me yet thou art my jesus what if my conception in sin condemns me still thou art my jesus what if my creation in sin under the curse condemns me nevertheless thou art my saviour what if my corrupted birth condemns me yet art thou my salvation what if the sins of my youth condemn me still art thou my jesus what if the course of my whole life defiled with most grievous sin condemns me yet thou remainest still my jesus what if the penalty of death to be inflicted upon me for my sins and various transgressions condemns me yet art thou still my saviour what if the awful sentence of the last judgment rise up against me yet will i trust thee and fly to thee as my jesus my saviour i am sinful reprobate condemned but in thy holy name there is righteousness election salvation but in thy name was i baptized in thy name do i believe in thy name will i die in thy name will i rise again and in thy blessed name will i appear at the judgment 
in thy name every conceivable good is provided for my soul and stored up in reserve as a sacred treasury alas how much of this good have i lost by my own distrust and blessed jesus i fervently pray that thou wilt graciously remove this distrust from me so that i whom thou dost so mercifully desire to save by thy precious merit and life-giving name may not condemn myself through my own fault and unbelief End of Meditation 4Behold, O Lord Jesus, how basely I have treated thy passion. My heart is deeply pained and my soul greatly saddened, because I have no works or merits of my own to offer for my salvation. Yet, since thy passion, O Jesus, may be my work, let thy works also be my merit. Surely I do not rightly treat thy passion, because when that is amply sufficient for my salvation, I am seeking to supplement it by my own good works. And if I should discover any righteousness in myself, thy righteousness would be of no avail to me, or certainly I should not so ardently desire it. If I seek to justify myself by the deeds of the law, I shall be condemned by the law. But if I know that I am no longer under the law but under grace, shamefully have I lived. O Holy Father, I have sinned against heaven, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But refuse not to call me thy servant. Let not, I beseech thee, the blessed benefits of thy passion be denied me. Let not thy precious blood become of no avail in freeing my soul from sin. Sin hath always dwelt in me. I beseech thee now, let it die with me. Hitherto the flesh hath had dominion over me. Now let the Spirit triumph in me. Let the outward man perish, that the inward man may rise into new glory. Hitherto I have always followed the temptations of the devil. Let him now, I pray thee, be trampled under my feet. Satan is at hand to accuse me, but he has nothing in me. The very idea of death terrifies me, and yet death will mark the end of my sin and the beginning of a perfectly holy life. Then at last shall I be able to please thee perfectly, O my God. Then at last shall I be established in goodness and virtue. Satan holds up my sins before me to terrify me, but let him accuse him who hath taken upon him my infirmities, and whom the Lord hath smitten for my sins. My debt is exceeding great, nor can I pay the least part of it, but I trust in the riches and kindness of my surety. Let him free me who hath become surety for me. Let him pay it who hath taken my debt upon himself. I have sinned, O Lord, and my sins are many and great beyond measure, and yet may I never voluntarily commit that most heinous sin of charging thee with a lie, when thou dost declare by words and by works and by an oath that perfect satisfaction has been rendered for mine iniquities. I fear not my sins, for thou art my righteousness. I fear not my ignorance, for thou art my wisdom. I fear not death, for thou art my life. I fear not my errors, for thou art my truth. I fear not my corruption, for thou art my resurrection. I fear not the pains of death, for thou art my joy. I fear not even the terrors of judgment, for thou art my righteousness. Let the dew of thy divine grace and of thy quickening consolation be instilled into my languishing soul. My spirit is drying up within me, yet soon it shall exult in thee. My flesh droops and languishes, but shortly it shall spring up again into new life. The nature of my body is such that I must undergo corruption, but from corruption thou shalt free me, as thou hast delivered me from every other evil. Thou, O God, hast created me, 
and how can the work of thy hands perish? Thou hast delivered me from all my enemies, how then could death alone prevail against me? Thy body, thy blood, and all that thou hadst, even thine own self, thou didst give for my salvation, and shall death then deprive me of that which is purchased with so costly a ransom? Thou art my righteousness, O Lord Jesus, my sins shall not prevail against thee. Thou art the resurrection and the life, death shall not prevail against thee. Thou art God, Satan shall not prevail against me. Thou hast given me the earnest of thy spirit, in this do I glory, in this do I triumph, and most firmly do I believe, doubting nothing, that I shall by and by be admitted to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Thou, O my dearest spouse, thou art my wedding garment, which I put on in my baptism. Thou wilt cover all my nakedness, nor shall I attempt to sew on to this most precious and beautiful garment the vile tatters of mine own righteousness. For what is our righteousness in thy sight but filthy rags? How could I dare then to patch the robe of thy glorious righteousness with mine own abominable rags? In this robe will I appear before thy judgment seat, when thou shalt judge the world in righteousness and equity. In this garment shall I appear before thee in thy heavenly kingdom. This robe shall so cover my confusion and shame that they will be remembered no more. Then shall I appear before thy face glorious and holy, and this flesh of mine, this body of mine, shall be clothed in thine effulgent glory, even a glory that shall continue for ever and ever. Come, Lord Jesus, come, and let him that loveth thee say, Come. End of Meditation 5Meditation 6 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Consolation for the Penitent Soul from the Passion of Christ The Cross of Christ is Our Crown Written during a very severe illness, January 1st, 1604 All the glory of the godly is in the shame of our Lord's Passion. All their rest is in the wounds of our crucified Saviour. His death is our life. His exaltation is our glory. How great is thy mercy, O Heavenly Father, O Almighty God! By mine own power I have offended thee, but by mine own power has it been impossible to please thee. Thou, therefore, in Christ, art reconciling me to thyself. Behold, O Holy God, the sacred mystery of thy flesh and remit the guilt of my flesh. Graciously regard what thy blessed Son hath patiently suffered, and overlook what thy sinful servant hath done. My flesh hath provoked thee to anger. Let the flesh of thy Son, I pray thee, incline thee to mercy. My sins deserve the severest punishment at thy hands, but far more hath the devotion of my Redeemer merited thy mercy. Great is my unrighteousness, but greater far is the righteousness of my Redeemer. As far as the mighty God is above puny man, so far is my wickedness beneath his goodness, in quality as well as in quantity. All that I am is thine, because thou hast created me. Grant, O Lord, that it may be wholly thine also by free and happy choice. Thou dost lead me to ask. Grant that I may also receive. Thou dost give me the disposition to seek, grant that I may find. Thou dost teach me to knock, open unto me, I beseech thee, when I do knock. From thee cometh the desire, may the power to obtain come also from thee. From thee I have the power to will, grant me also the power to do. Holy God, just judge. If my sins are concealed, they are incurable. If seen, they are detestable. They grievously distress me, but more than all, they oppress me with a horrible fear. Withhold not, I beseech thee, O God, thy real and tender compassion, where thou seest such real and awful misery. Where sin abounds, 
may grace much more abound. Holy Father, do not, I pray thee, pour out upon me thy wrath, since for my sins thou hast smitten thy blessed Son. Holy Jesus, deliver me, I beseech thee, from divine wrath, for that thou hast borne upon the cross for my sake. Holy Spirit, protect me, I implore thee, with thy blessed consolation from the wrath of God, who in the gospel hath announced mercy to the penitent and contrite soul. O holy God, O righteous judge, no whither can I flee from the face of thy wrath. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I descend into hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. To Christ, therefore, will I flee, and in his wounds will I hide me. O merciful God, behold the body of thy Son so sorely wounded in every part, and regard not the wounds of my sins. Let the blood of thy Son cleanse me from every sinful stain. Hear thou his most earnest prayer, offered for the salvation of his chosen ones. O holy God, thou righteous judge, my life terrifies me. For a diligent examination of it discloses only sin and unfruitfulness. And what fruit does appear therein is either so false or imperfect or in some way so corrupted that it either cannot please thee or is absolutely displeasing to thine eyes. Truly, my whole life is, on the one hand, sinful and worthy of thy condemnation, and on the other unfruitful and wretched. But why do I distinguish between unfruitful and worthy of condemnation? For certainly, if it is unfruitful, it is to be condemned. For every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit shall be cast into the fire. And not only shall that tree be burned which bears evil fruit, but that also which bears no fruit. When I think of those on thy left hand in the judgment, I am sore afraid, since they are there not because they have done anything bad, but because they have done nothing good. To the hungry they gave no food, to the thirsty no drink. O fruitless tree, thou art dry and useless, and fit only for the eternal flames. What answer wilt thou make in that dread day, when, in the twinkling of an eye, thy whole life shall lie open before thee, and the righteous judge shall sternly demand how thou hast spent it? Not a hair of thy head shall perish unnoticed, nor a moment of thy life pass unjudged. O oh, what a strait to be in! On the one hand will be thy sins accusing thee, on the other God's righteousness striking terror into thy soul. Beneath thee the horrible pit of hell shall gape with wide open mouth, and above thee shall sit the righteously angry judge. Within thee a burning conscience, without thee a burning world. The righteous shall scarcely be saved, whither then shall a guilty sinner turn? To hide will be impossible, and yet to appear before God intolerable. How then can I possibly be saved? With whom shall I take counsel? Who is he that is called the Wonderful, the Counselor? It is Jesus himself, the very same who is my judge, and in whose hands I am trembling with fear. Take courage then, O my soul, and despair not. Hope thou in him whom thou dost fear. Flee thou to him for refuge from whom thou hast fled in fear. O Jesus Christ, for thy name's sake, deal with me according to thy name. Mercifully regard me, a miserable sinner, as I call upon thy name. If thou shouldest admit me within the capacious bosom of thy compassion, it will not be the more straitened on my account. True is it, O Lord, that my participation in sin merits condemnation, and my penitence can never satisfy thee. But certain is it also that thy mercy exceeds all my offence. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me not be confounded for ever. End of Meditation 6Meditation 7 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhard Translated by C. W. Heisler This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fruit of Our Lord's Passion 
The passion of Christ is my hope. Whenever I meditate upon the suffering of my Lord, I cannot but venture a great deal in respect to the love of God and his forbearance toward my sins. He bends his head to kiss me. He extends his arms to embrace me. He opens his hands to bestow gifts upon me. He opens his side, that I may behold his heart glowing with love for me. He is lifted up from the earth, that he may draw all men to himself. His wounds are livid with grief, yet gleaming with love. And in those open wounds we must seek for the secret of his heart. Truly, with him is plenteous redemption. For not a drop only, but streams of blood flow from five parts of his body. As a bunch of grapes cast into a press is crushed by the weight placed upon it, and on all sides pours forth its juice, so the flesh of Christ, crushed and by the weight of divine wrath and the severity of our sins, pours out on all sides its precious life blood. When Abraham showed his willingness to offer his son in sacrifice, the Lord said to him, Now truly I know that thou lovest me. Acknowledge also the wonderful love of the Eternal Father, and that he was willing to deliver up to death his only begotten Son for us. He loved us while we were yet enemies. Will he forget us, now that we are reconciled by the death of his Son? Can he be unmindful of the precious blood of his own Son, when he numbers even the tears and the steps of his godly children? Can Christ possibly forget in his life those for whom he was willing to suffer death? Can he, enthroned in glory, forget those for whom he bore such awful anguish upon earth? Consider, O faithful soul, the manifold fruit of thy Lord's passion. Christ, for us endured the bloody sweat, that the icy sweat of death's agony might not disturb us. He willingly wrestled with death, that we might not fail in the last trying hour, and endured the severest anguish and sorrow, that we might become partakers of the eternal joys of heaven. He suffered himself to be betrayed by a kiss, the token of friendship and good will, that he might forever destroy sin by which Satan had betrayed our first parents under the guise of a tender friendship. He suffered himself to be taken and bound by the Jews, in order to deliver us who lay bound in the fetters of sin and under eternal condemnation. He was willing that his passion should begin in the garden, in making an atonement for sin, because in the garden of paradise sin had had its beginning. He submitted to be strengthened by an angel, that he might make us the companions of the holy angels in heaven. He is deserted by his own disciples, so that he might unite us to himself the more closely, who for our base defection had been cut off by God. He was accused by false witnesses before the council, that we might not be accused by Satan at the last day, through that broken law of God. He was condemned on earth, that we might be acquitted in heaven. He who did no sin kept silence before sinners, that we might not be struck dumb for our sins when brought before the judgment bar of God on account of our sins. He suffered himself to be smitten on the cheek, to free us from the stings of conscience and the buffetings of Satan, and to be mocked and insulted, that we might set at naught the jibes and jeers of Satan. His face is covered, that he might remove from our faces the veil of sin, which hides God from our eyes and leads us into culpable ignorance. He willingly submitted to be stripped of his garments, that he might restore to us the robe of innocence lost through our transgressions. He was pierced with thorns, that he might heal our sin-pierced hearts. He bore the burden of the cross, so that he might remove from us the awful burden of eternal punishment. He exclaimed that he was forsaken by God, that he might prepare for us an everlasting habitation with God. He thirsted upon the cross, that he might meritoriously earn for us the dues of divine grace and prevent our dying of eternal soul-thirst. He was willing to be scorched by the flames of divine wrath, that he might deliver us from the flames of hell. He was judged, 
that he might free us from God's judgment, condemned as a criminal, that we, the real criminals, might be acquitted, was smitten by impious hands, that he might deliver us from the devil's lash, cried out with bitter pain, to save us from eternal wailings. He shed tears upon the earth, that he might wipe away all tears from our eyes in heaven. He died, that we might live. He suffered the pains of hell, that we might never experience them. He was humbled before men, that he might heal our sinful pride. He wore the crown of thorns, that he might win for us a heavenly crown. He suffered for all, that he might offer salvation to all. His eyes were darkened in death, that we might live for ever in the light of heavenly glory. He heard the most bitter scoffs and taunts of wicked men, that we might hear the jubilant shouts of the angels in heaven. Despair not, then, O faithful soul. Infinite good hast thou offended by thy sins, but an infinite price has been paid for thy salvation. Thou must be judged for thy sins, but the Son of God hath already been judged for the sins of the whole world, which he took upon himself. Thy sins must be punished, but God has already punished them in the person of his own Son. Great are the wounds of thy sins, but precious is the balm of Christ's blood. Moses in the law pronounces a curse upon thee, because thou hast not observed all things written in the book of the law to do them. But Christ was made a curse for thee when he hung upon the tree. The handwriting was written against thee in the heavenly court, but that has been erased by the blood of Christ. Thy passion, then, O holy and gracious Christ, is my last and only refuge. End of Meditation 7「Meditation 8 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Certainty of Our Salvation A good hope cannot be confounded. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou still doubting the mercy of God? Remember thy Creator. Who hath created thee without any concurrence of thine own will? Who was he that formed thy body in secret, when thy substance was curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth? Will not he who cared for thee before thou hadst any being care for thee now, after he hath formed thee in his own image? I am a creature of God. To my Creator, then, do I betake myself. What if my nature is corrupted by the devil, and pierced and wounded by my sins, as by murderous robbers? yet my Creator still lives. He who could create me at first can now restore me. He who created me without sin can now remove from me all the sin which has entered into me and has permeated my whole being, either through the temptation of the devil, through Adam's fault, or through my own actual transgressions. My Creator can restore my soul if only He is willing to do so. And certainly He is willing for who can hate the work of his own hands? Are we not before him as clay in the hands of the potter? But if he had hated me, certainly he would not have created me from nothing. He is the Saviour of all men, and especially of those that believe. It is wonderful that he created me, and still more wonderful that he redeemed me. Never did our Lord give a clearer proof of his great love for us than in his bitter passion and bleeding wounds on Calvary in our behalf. Truly we are loved, since for us and our salvation the only begotten Son is sent from the bosom of the Father. And if thou didst not desire to save me, O Lord Jesus, why didst thou descend from heaven? But thou didst descend to the earth, and didst become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. To redeem a servant, God spared not his own Son. Truly hath God loved the world with an unspeakable love, since for its redemption he delivered up his own Son to be smitten, to be crucified, to be put to death. Inexpressibly great was the price of our redemption. Great and marvelous, then, is the mercy of God in our redemption. 
it would almost seem to one as if god loves his elect children as dearly as he loves his only begotten son for what we obtain by purchase we certainly esteem of greater value than that which we give in exchange for it and that he might have adopted sons god did not spare his own co-essential son what marvel then that he should have prepared mansions in his heavenly home for us since he has given his own son in whom is all the fullness of the godhead certainly where the fullness of the godhead is there is likewise the fullness of eternal life and glory and if in christ he hath given the fullness of eternal life how will he deny us a little particle of it truly god has greatly loved us his adopted sons since for us he gave his only begotten son truly the son has greatly loved us since for us he gave himself to make us rich he took upon himself the direst poverty for he had not where to lay his head that he might make us the sons of god he became a man and the work of redemption being finished he does not now neglect us but sitting at the right hand of the divine majesty he there maketh intercession for us what that is necessary to my salvation will he not accomplish for me since he hath devoted himself to the work of my eternal salvation what will the father deny the son who became obedient to him unto death even the death of the cross what will the father deny the son since he hath already accepted the ransom offered by the son what if my sins accuse me in this intercessor do i trust greater is he who is for me than my sins that are against me what if my very weakness terrifies me in his strength do i glory what if satan accuses me if only this mediator shall pardon me what if the heavens and the earth accuse me and mine iniquities declare my guilt yet it is enough for me that the creator of the heavens and of the earth and he who is righteousness itself pleads my cause for me it suffices for me to acknowledge his merit because mine will not suffice and it is enough for me to have him propitious toward me against whom alone i have sinned whatever he shall not impute to me shall be as though it had never been nor does the fact that my sins are so grievous and so varied and so oft repeated move me in this trust for if I had not been burdened with sin, I should not so ardently desire his righteousness. If I were not sick, I would not call in the aid of the physician. He himself is my physician. He himself is my Savior. He himself is my righteousness. He cannot deny himself. I am spiritually sick. I am condemned. I am a sinner. I cannot deny myself have mercy upon me o thou my blessed physician my saviour my righteousness amen end of meditation eight meditation nine of sacred meditations by johann gerhardt translated by c w heisler this librivox recording is in the public domain loving god alone may love bind thee fast to the lord rouse thyself o faithful soul and love thou him who is the highest good in whom is every good thing and without whom there is nothing truly good no created thing can really satisfy our soul's desires for no creature possesses all of perfect good in itself but only that good in which it participates a rivulet of goodness from the divine fountain may flow down to it from above but the fountain itself always remains in god why then should we desire to leave the fountain and follow the rivulet every manifestation of good in the creature is but an image of the perfect goodness which is in god nay which is god himself why then should we desire to leave the reality to grasp the image the dove sent out from noah's ark could not find amid the raging waters a place of rest for her feet 
Thus our souls, amid the vast multitude of earthly comforts, can find nothing to satisfy fully their immortal desires, because these things are so very frail and fleeting in character. Does not that man do himself injury, who loves anything beneath the dignity of his nature? Our souls are far more noble than any created thing, because redeemed by the passion and death of God. Why then should we stoop to love the creature? Would not that be inconsistent with the dignity to which God has exalted the human soul? Whatever we love, we love because of its power, its wisdom, or its beauty. Now what is more powerful, what is wiser, what is more beautiful than God? All the power of earthly monarchs is from him and is subject to him. All human wisdom compared with the divine is foolishness. All creature beauty in comparison with God's is absolute deformity. If a very powerful earthly sovereign were to send his messengers to seek in marriage a maiden of humble birth and fortune, would not that maiden act very foolishly to reject the hand of the king and take up with his poor messengers and servants instead? And God, through the beauty of the works of his own hands, desires to call me to himself and to incite me to love him alone. Why then should my soul, which Christ the heavenly bridegroom seeks to unite to himself, cling to a mere creature as the messenger of this spiritual union which he desires to make with me? These creatures themselves exclaim, Why dost thou cling so fondly to us? Why dost thou seek thy highest good in us? We cannot satisfy thy longings. Haste thee to our common Creator. We dare not hope that the things of the earth will reciprocate our love. Nor do they first love us, but God, who is love, cannot but love those who love him. Nay, more, he even anticipates all our desires and all our love with his own love. Ah, how much then ought we to love him who first so dearly loved us? He loved us before we had any being. For it is because of his divine love that we were born into the world. He loved us when we were yet enemies. For it is because of his divine love and compassion that he sent his Son to redeem us. He loved us when we had fallen into sin. For it is because of his divine love that he does not instantly deliver us over to death when we transgress against him, but patiently awaits our conversion. It is because of his divine love that, above what we deserve, a even in very opposition to our just deserts, he is leading us to his heavenly mansions. Without the love of God, never couldst thou come to a saving knowledge of God. Without that love, all knowledge would be worthless, nay more, it would be harmful to thee. Why does love exceed the knowledge of all mysteries? Because the latter may be found even in the devil, but the former only in the godly. Why is the devil the most unhappy being? Because he cannot love the highest good. Why is God, on the other hand, the most happy and blessed of all beings? Because he loves all things, and takes delight in all the works of his own hands. Why is the love of God not perfected in us in this life? Simply because we love only as we know, and in this life we know only in part and as in a riddle. In heaven we shall be perfectly happy because we shall love God perfectly, and we shall love Him perfectly because we shall know Him perfectly. But no one may cherish a hope of loving God perfectly in the future life who does not begin to love Him in this life. The kingdom of God must begin in the heart of man in this life, or it will never be consummated in the life that is to come. Without the love of God we have no desire for eternal life. And how then can we become sharers of that highest good if we do not love it, if we do not desire it, if we do not seek it? What thy love is that thou art, because thy love changes thee into itself. Love is the very strongest bond, because the lover and the object loved become one. What is it that has joined together a righteous man and lost sinners so infinitely removed from each other? Infinite love. And that the righteousness of God might not be rendered of no effect, Christ interposed his infinite ransom. 
What is it that has joined together a righteous God and lost sinners so infinitely removed from each other? Infinite love. And that the righteousness of God might not be rendered of no effect, Christ interposed his infinite ransom. What is it, moreover, that unites those so far separated from each other as God the Almighty Creator and a believing soul, the work of his hands? Love. In heaven we shall be united to God in the very highest degree. Why? Because we shall love him in the very highest degree. Love unites and transforms. If thou lovest carnal things, thou art carnal. If thou lovest earthly things, thou shalt become earthly. But flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. If thou lovest God and divine things, thou shalt become divine. The love of God is the chariot of Elijah ascending to heaven. The love of God is the delight of the mind, the paradise of the soul. It destroys the power of the world, conquers the devil, shuts the mouth of hell, and opens wide the gate of heaven. The love of God is the seal of God upon his elect and believing children. God will not acknowledge as his own in the last judgment those who are not sealed with this seal. For faith itself, which is the sole means of our justification and salvation, is not genuine unless it shows itself by love. It is not true faith unless it be also an unwavering trust, and such a trust is impossible without the love of God. A benefit is not recognized for which thanks are not rendered. We are not truly thankful to him whom we do not love. If thy faith is genuine, it will recognize the great benefits conferred by Christ thy Redeemer. Aye, it will recognize and render thanks. It will render thanks, and it will love him. The love of God is life and rest to our souls. When the soul departs through death, the body dies. But when God departs from the soul through sin, the soul dies. On the other hand, God dwells in our hearts by faith. He dwells in our souls by love, because the love of God is shed abroad in the hearts of the elect by the Holy Spirit. There is no peace of mind without the love of God. The world and the devil are its greatest sources of trouble, but God is its true and highest rest. There is no peace of conscience except to those who are justified by faith. There is no true love of God except in those who have a childlike trust in God. Therefore let the love of ourselves, the love of the world, the love of the creature, die in us, that the love of God may dwell in us. And may God begin that love in us in this life, that he may perfect it in life eternal. End of Meditation 9「Meditation 10 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Our Reconciliation with God Christ has paid my debt of sin. Truly, Christ hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. O Lord Jesus, the eternal punishment which we deserve for our sins thou hast transferred to thyself. The weight of iniquity, which would have sunk us down to hell, thou hast taken upon thyself. Thou wast wounded for our transgressions, thou wast bruised for our iniquities. With thy stripes we are healed, and the Lord hath laid upon thee the iniquities of us all. Wonderful, indeed, is the exchange thou dost make. Our sins thou takest upon thyself, and thy righteousness thou dost impute to us. The death due us for our transgressions thou dost thyself suffer, and in turn dost bestow eternal life upon us. Therefore I can no longer doubt of thy grace or despair on account of my sins. The very worst that was in us thou hast taken upon thyself. How then wilt thou despise our body and soul, the very best that is in us, and the work of thine own hands? Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Holy indeed must he be whose sins have been blotted out and taken away. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, 
Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. How can the Lord impute our iniquities to us after he hath once imputed them to another? For the sins of the people he hath smitten his dearly beloved son. Therefore by his knowledge shall he justify many, and he shall bear their iniquities. How shall he justify his people? Give ear, O my soul, and listen. He will justify them by his knowledge, that is, by a saving acknowledgment of the divine mercy and grace in Christ, and a firm apprehension thereof through faith. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and thy Son, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And again, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Faith, moreover, lays hold of the satisfaction of Christ, for he hath borne their iniquities, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Few righteous souls indeed would he have had, had he not so mercifully received sinners. Few righteous souls wouldst thou now have, O Jesus, if thou didst not so graciously forgive the sins of the unrighteous. How therefore will Christ, in the dreadful day of judgment, pass sentence upon the penitent for their sins, when he hath already taken them upon himself? How will he condemn the guilty sinner, when he himself hath been made sin for him? Will he judge those whom he calls his own friends? Will he judge those for whom he hath interceded? Will he judge those for whom he hath died? Take courage, O my soul, and forget thy sins, because thy Lord hath forgotten them. Whom dost thou fear as the avenger of thy sins but the Lord? And yet he himself hath rendered satisfaction for thy sins. Now if any one else had offered a ransom for my sins, I could not but be in doubt as to whether my righteous judge would be willing to accept such a satisfaction. If a mere man or an angel had made an atonement for me, it would still be doubtful whether the ransom offered for my redemption were sufficient. But now there is absolutely no room for doubt. How could he refuse the ransom which he himself hath offered? How could the satisfaction possibly be insufficient when made by God himself? Why art thou still disquieted, O my soul? All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Why then art thou disquieted, O my soul? Let the mercy of the Lord cheer thee. Let the divine justice encourage thee. For what if God is just? Yet he certainly will not demand a double satisfaction for the sins of a single person. He hath already smitten his son for our sins. How can he then smite us, his servants, for the same sins? How can he inflict upon us the punishment which he hath already visited upon his son for our sins? The truth of the Lord endureth for ever. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that he may turn from his way and live, says our God. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, is our Saviour's gracious word. Shall we charge the Lord with a lie, or try to render his mercy of no effect by the weight of our sins? To charge God with a lie and to deny his mercy is one of the greatest sins we can commit from which it appears that Judas committed a greater sin in despairing of God's mercy than did the Jews in crucifying Christ. Yea, rather, where sin abounded, grace hath much more abounded, and his grace infinitely outweighs my sins, for sin is man's act, grace is God's. Sin is temporal, but the grace of our God is from everlasting to everlasting. For my sins, complete satisfaction hath been rendered. By Christ's death, the grace of God hath been restored to me and established eternally, and to it I flee for refuge, with devout and earnest supplication. End of Meditation 10「The Satisfaction for Our Sins 
the death of Christ is the life of the godly. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, are the precious words of our Savior. Truly, my dear Lord Jesus, I am burdened beyond measure, and I groan under the awful weight of my sins. But I hasten to thee, the fountain of living waters. Come unto me, O Lord Jesus, so that I may be able to come unto thee. I am coming to thee because thou hast first come to me. I am coming to thee, my dear Lord Jesus, and most ardently do I desire thee, for I can find no good in myself at all. And if I could find anything good in me, I should not so anxiously long for thee. Truly, O Lord Jesus, I labor and am heavy laden. I dare not compare myself to any of thy saints, nor even to any repentant sinner, unless perchance to the penitent thief upon the cross. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, thou who didst show thyself so merciful to that penitent malefactor. Wretchedly, wretchedly have I lived. My life hath been one of sin, but, O, oh, I do desire to die the death of the godly and of the righteous. But godliness and righteousness are far from my heart, and so in thy godliness and in thy righteousness I take refuge. Thou didst give thy life, O Lord Jesus, as a ransom for many. Let that come to my succor in my distress. Thy most holy body thou didst give to be scourged, to be spit upon, to be buffeted, to be lacerated with thorns, and to be crucified, and all for me. O oh, let that come to my help in my distress. Let thy most precious blood, which thou didst so freely shed in thy bitter sufferings and cruel death upon the cross, and which cleanseth us from all sin, be my help. Let thy most sacred divinity, which sustained thy human nature and thy passion, which refrained from the exercise of its glorious power while the adorable mystery of my redemption was being wrought out, and which gave infinite value and merit to thy suffering for sin, so that God might ransom me, me a miserable sinner, with his own blood, come to my assistance in my distress. In thy bleeding wounds is my only remedy. Let them succor me. Let thy most holy passion be my defense. Let thy merit, my last refuge, and the only remedy for my sins, be my comfort and my support. What thou hast suffered, O Christ, thou hast suffered for me. What thy sufferings have merited, they have merited for me, and are set over against my unworthiness. God, therefore, commendeth his love toward us, and by the testimony of all men, yea, by its surpassing the comprehension even of the angels, confirms it, in that while we were yet sinners and enemies, Christ died for us. Who is there who does not wonder at this? Who is not struck with deep amazement, that, unasked by any one, nay, even hated by men, the most merciful Son of God intercedes for sinners and for his enemies? And not only that, but renders a perfect satisfaction to divine justice for their sins by his poor and humble birth, by his holy life, by his most bitter sufferings and cruel death. O blessed Lord Jesus, Thou who didst intercede for me, who didst suffer for me, who didst die for me, before I ever showed any desire for Thy merit and passion, and before I ever besought Thee to pay the ransom for my redemption, how couldst thou now cast me away from thy face? How wilt thou deny me the blessed fruits of thy holy passion when I cry to thee out of the depths of my sin, and with tears and groans supplicate thee for mercy? I was thine enemy by nature, but since thou hast died for me, I am become thy friend, thy brother, thy child through grace. Thou didst have regard to me while yet an enemy, and before I ever uttered a prayer to thee, wilt thou disregard me, when with tears and prayers I come to thee as thy friend? If I come unto thee, thou wilt not cast me out, because thy word is truth itself. Thou hast spoken to us in spirit and truth, and we have received from thee the words of eternal life. Give ear, O my soul, and take courage. 
For formerly we were sinners by nature, but now are we justified by grace. Before we were his enemies, now we are his friends and kindred. Before our help was in the death of Christ, now it is in his life. Once we were dead in our sins, now we are quickened with Christ. O oh, the immeasurable love of God! O oh, the exceeding riches of his grace, by which he makes us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus! O oh, the tender mercy of our God, whereby the dayspring from on high hath visited us! Now, if the death of Christ hath brought justification and life to us, what shall his life secure for us? If the Saviour, by his death, paid such a precious ransom for us, what will he accomplish for us by his life and active intercession? For Christ lives and dwells in our hearts by faith, if only we cherish in us a lively remembrance of his most holy merit. Draw me, O Lord Jesus, that I may possess in deed and in truth that which I look for with an unwavering hope. Let me be with thee as thy servant, I pray thee, and let me behold thy glory which the Father hath given thee. Let me by and by dwell in that mansion which thou hast gone to prepare for me in thy Father's house. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house, O Lord. They shall praise thee for ever and ever. End of Meditation 11Meditation 12 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. True Faith, Its Nature and Properties True Faith is Living and Victorious Consider, O my beloved soul, the excellency of faith, and then give thanks to God from whom alone it comes. Faith alone unites us to our Saviour, so that we derive our spiritual life, our justification, and our salvation from Him, as the branches draw all their sustenance from the vine. Adam fell from God's grace, and lost, by his unbelief, the divine image. But we are received into a state of grace, and are formed anew in the divine image by faith. Through faith Christ becomes ours and dwells in us. But where Christ is, there is the grace of God. And where the grace of God is, there is the heritage of life eternal. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So by faith we offer spiritual sacrifices to God, that is, the fruit of our lips. By faith Enoch was translated. So faith, even while we tarry in this life, exalts us above the mere companionship of men into blessed fellowship with God. For even now, Christ dwells in us. We have already eternal life, although hidden. By faith Noah prepared an ark, and thus by faith we enter the church of Christ, and our souls are saved, while those who remain in the vast ocean of the world miserably perish. By faith Abraham left his own idolatrous country. So by faith we come out from the world, forsaking parents, brothers, kindred, and clinging to the word of Christ, who calls us to himself. By faith he sojourned in a strange country, looking for the land of promise. So by faith we look forward to Jerusalem that is above, which God hath prepared for us in heaven. We are strangers and sojourners upon earth, and by faith we desire and hope to come by and by to our heavenly inheritance. By faith Sarah in her old age received strength to bear Isaac, her son. And so, by faith, though spiritually dead, we receive strength to bring forth Christ in our lives. For as Christ was once conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, so is he daily born in the faithful soul that keeps itself pure and free from worldly defilement. By faith Abraham offered up Isaac. So also do we, by faith, offer up in sacrifice our own will that beloved son of our soul. For he who desires to follow Christ must deny himself, that is, he must renounce his own will, his own honor, his own affections. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob. So by faith we are made partakers of all God's blessings. For in Abraham's seed 
that is, in Christ, all nations of the earth are blessed. By faith Joseph prophesied concerning the departure of the children of Israel from Egypt, and gave commandment concerning his bones. So by faith we look forward with glad hearts to our departure from this world, our spiritual Egypt, and to the glorious resurrection of our bodies. By faith Moses was hid three months of his parents. So faith hides us from the dreadful tyranny of Satan until at length we shall be led into the royal palace of our God and adopted as the child of the King of Glory. By faith Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to live in the glory of Egypt. So by faith we may despise the glory and honor and riches of this world while our hearts are stirred by longing desires for the heavenly kingdom. By faith we choose rather to suffer shame with Christ than all the treasures of this world. By faith Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. And thus faith inspires and confirms us, so that we do not fear the threats of any of earth's tyrants, but with a courageous and resolute spirit obey the voice of our God. By faith Israel kept the Passover, so also do we celebrate our paschal supper by faith christ our passover is sacrificed for us whose flesh is meat indeed and whose blood is drink indeed by faith the israelites passed through the red sea so by faith do we pass through the troublous waves of this world by faith the walls of jericho fell down so by faith may we lay low all the strongholds of satan by faith Rahab was preserved alive. So, in the universal ruin that shall overtake this world, we shall by faith be saved from destruction. By faith the fathers subdued kingdoms, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire. So, by faith, we may destroy Satan's kingdom, escape the snares and fury of that infernal lion, and be delivered from the awful fires of hell. But faith is not a mere opinion or empty profession. It is a living and efficacious apprehension of Christ as he is set forth in the gospel. It is a most hearty conviction of God's grace to us, a confident tranquility of heart and an undisturbed peace of conscience relying upon the merit of Christ. Such a faith springs from the seed of the divine word. For faith and the Spirit are one, but the word is that by means of which the Holy Spirit is conveyed into our souls. The fruit is of the same nature as the seed. Faith is a divine fruit. Therefore the divine seed, that is God's word, must always be present. Just as at the creation light appeared at the word of God, for God said, Let there be light, and there was light, so the light of faith arises from the light of the divine word. In thy light shall we see light, says the psalmist. Since faith unites us so closely to Christ, it is really the mother of all virtues in us. Where faith is, there Christ is. Where Christ is, there is a holy life, namely true humility, true gentleness, true love. Christ and the Holy Spirit are never separated. And when the Holy Spirit is present in a soul, there is true holiness. Therefore, where the life is not holy, the sanctifying Spirit must be absent. And if the Holy Spirit be absent, Christ cannot be there. And if Christ is not there, then neither is true faith there. Any branch that draws not its life and succor from the vine cannot be considered as united with the vine. And so we are not united to Christ by faith unless we derive all our spiritual life and strength from Him. Faith is our spiritual light. It illumines our hearts. It sheds abroad the genial influence of its rays in our good works. And where good works, those bright beams of the spiritual life, are wanting, there the light of true faith hath not yet arisen. Evil deeds are the works of darkness, but faith is light. And what communion hath light with darkness? Evil works are Satan's seed. Faith is Christ's seed. And what concord hath Christ with Satan? Faith purifies our hearts. But how can there be inward purity of heart where impure words and impure deeds appear outwardly? Faith is our victory. 
How then can there be true faith, where the flesh rules the spirit and leads it captive at its will? Through faith we have Christ dwelling in us, and in Christ we have life eternal. But no impenitent sinner, continuing in his sin, has any part or lot in eternal life. How then can he have Christ in him? How can he lay any claim to true faith? Enkindle in us, O blessed Christ, the light of true faith, that through faith we may obtain eternal salvation. End of Meditation 12「Meditation 13 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Spiritual Marriage of the Soul with Christ Christ is the Spouse of the Soul I will betroth thee unto me for ever, says Christ to the faithful soul. Christ desired to be present at the marriage in Cana of Galilee, so as to show us that he had come to the earth to celebrate his spiritual nuptials with believing souls. Rejoice greatly in the Lord, and be joyful in thy God, O faithful soul, for he hath clothed thee with the garments of salvation, he hath covered thee with a robe of righteousness, as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. Rejoice because of the distinguished honor of thy spouse. Rejoice because of the surpassing beauty of thy spouse. Rejoice because of his marvelous love toward thee. His honor is the very greatest, for he is true God, blessed for ever. How great, then, is the dignity and worth of the soul, since the Creator himself wishes to espouse it to himself. His beauty is the very greatest, for his form is fairer than the children of men. Since they beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as snow. Grace is poured into his lips. He is crowned with glory and honor. How wonderful, then, his mercy, that, though he is the perfection of beauty, he does not disdain to choose for his personal bride the soul of the sinner, all stained and defiled with sin, though it be. Here is the height of majesty in the bridegroom, and the depth of lowliness in the bride, surpassing beauty in the bridegroom, forbidding deformity in the bride. And yet, greater is the bridegroom's love toward his bride than hers toward her most majestic and most beautiful spouse. Consider, O faithful soul, his immeasurable love towards thee, a love that brought him from heaven to earth, a love that bound him to the post to be scourged, a love that nailed him to the cross, a love that enclosed him in the sepulchre, a love that dragged him down to hell. What led him to suffer all this but a tender love for his spouse? And our hearts must be harder than stone and lead, if such mighty love as this does not draw them upwards towards God, for whom it first drew God himself down to man. The bride was naked and bare, nor could she thus appear in the royal palace of the heavenly king, but he clothed her with the garments of salvation, and covered her with the robe of righteousness. When she lay wrapped in the filthy garments of her sins, and in the shameful rags of her iniquities, he gave fine linen, clean and white, in which she might clothe herself. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. This garment is the righteousness of her spouse, procured by his death and passion. Jacob served fourteen years to win Rachel for his wife, but Christ for nearly thirty years endured hunger, thirst, cold, poverty, ignominy, reproaches, bonds, the scourge, the vinegar and gall, and the awful death of the cross, that he might prepare for himself and win as his bride the believing soul. Samson went down and sought a wife from among the Philistines, a people devoted to destruction, but the Son of God came down from heaven to choose his bride from among men, condemned and devoted to eternal death. The whole race to which his bride belonged was hostile to the heavenly Father, but he reconciled it to his Father by his most bitter passion. The bride was polluted in her own blood, and was cast out upon the face of the earth, but he washed her in the water of baptism, and cleansed her in the most holy labor of regeneration. Her bloody stains he cleansed with his own blood, for the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cleanseth us from all sin. 
foul and defiled was his bride, but he anointed her with the oil of his mercy and grace. She was not honorably attired as his spouse, but he decked her with ornaments, and adorned her with the varied virtues and gifts of the Holy Spirit. She was wretchedly poor, so that she could bring him no dower, so he mercifully gave her the earnest of his Holy Spirit, and accepted from her the earnest of her flesh, and carried it with him into heaven. He found his bride famishing with hunger, and he gave her to eat fine wheat and honey and oil, and with his own body and blood he continues to feed her unto eternal life. She is often disobedient and unfaithful to her marriage vow to Christ, her heavenly bridegroom, in her unholy alliance with the world and the devil, but he, out of his abundant love, receives her again whenever she returns to him in true penitence. Acknowledge, O faithful soul, these many marvellous instances of Christ's love to thee. Cherish thou the love of him, who for the love of thee entered the virgin's womb. We ought to love him as much more than we love ourselves, as he who gave himself for us is greater than we. We ought to yield our whole life unto him, who for love of us yielded himself up wholly unto us. He who does not love the Christ who first loved him must be deservedly held as basely ungrateful. Oh, how much we ought to love him, who for pure love of us laid aside, as it were, his divine majesty. O oh, happy soul that is united to Christ by the bonds of this spiritual marriage, thou mayest securely and confidently appropriate to thyself all the benefits of Christ's redemption, just as a wife shines resplendently in the glory that belongs to her husband. It is by faith alone that we are made partakers of this blessed spiritual union, as it is written, I will betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. By faith, we are engrafted as branches into Christ, the spiritual vine, so that we derive all our life and strength from Him. And as those united in marriage are no longer twain, but one flesh, so he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, because Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. Faith, if it is genuine, worketh by love just as the high priests in the old economy were obliged to marry virgins, so this heavenly high priest unites to himself in spiritual union such souls as keep themselves pure and unspotted from the embraces of the world and the flesh and the devil. O Christ, do thou graciously make us worthy to be admitted finally to the marriage of the Lamb. Amen. End of Meditation 13「Meditation 14 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mystery of the Incarnation Christ's Cradle Glows with a Heavenly Light Let us for a little while withdraw our minds from temporal things, and contemplate the mystery of our Lord's birth. The Son of God came down from heaven, that we might receive the adoption of sons. God became man, that man might become a partaker of divine grace and of the divine nature. Christ chose to be born into the world in the evening of the world's life, to signify that the benefits of his incarnation pertain not to this present life, but to eternal life. He chose to be born in the time of the peaceful Augustus, because he was the blessed peacemaker between man and God. He chose to be born in the time of Israel's servitude, because he is the true liberator and defender of his people. He chose to be born under the reign of a foreign prince, seeing that his kingdom is not of this world. He is born of a virgin, to signify that he is born in the hearts of spiritual virgins only, that is, in those who are not joined to the world or to the devil, but to God by one spirit. He is born pure and holy, that he might sanctify our impure and defiled birth. He is born of a virgin, espoused to a man, that he might set forth the honor of marriage as a divine institution. He was born in the darkness of the night, who came as the true light to illumine the darkness of the world. 
He who is the true food of our souls is laid in a manger. He is born among the beasts of the stall, that he might restore to their former dignity and honour sinful men, who through their sins have made themselves little better than the beasts. He is born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, who brought with himself from heaven the bread of life for our souls. He is the first and only begotten of his mother here on earth, who, according to his divine nature, is the first and only begotten of his Father in heaven. He is born poor and needy, that he might prepare the riches of heaven for us. He is born in a mean stable, that he might lead us back to the royal palace of his Father in heaven. He is sent from heaven as the messenger of redemptive grace, because no one on earth knew its exceeding greatness. It is with good reason that he, a heavenly messenger, should bring us the tidings of those heavenly blessings that are reserved for us at his right hand above. The angelic hosts rejoice at the birth of Christ, because through the incarnation of the Son of God they can have us poor mortals as the companions of their blessedness. This great wonder is first announced to shepherds, because as the true shepherd of souls, he has come at that time to bring back his lost sheep into the fold. The glad tidings of great joy are proclaimed to the despised and lowly, because no one can become a sharer of that joy who is not lightly esteemed in his own eyes. The nativity is announced to those watching their flocks by night, because only those can become partakers of this great gift to man, whose hearts are watchful toward God, and not those who are fast asleep in sin. And now the multitude of the heavenly host, who had so sorely grieved over the sin of our first parent, shout aloud for joy. The splendor of our Lord and King appears in the heavens, whose lowliness upon the earth looked so mean in the eyes of men. The angel bids the shepherds fear not, because of the birth of him who should remove from us every cause of fear. Good tidings of great joy are announced, because the author and giver of all joy was born into the world. They are bidden rejoice, because the enmity between God and man, the real cause of all our sorrow, was removed. Glory to God in the highest, they sang, because by the willful transgression of his command, our first parents sought to rob God of his glory. The birth of Christ brought true peace to men, who before this were the enemies of God, were at war with their own consciences, and at variance among themselves. True peace was thus restored to earth, because he was overcome, who had led us captive at his will. Let us now go with the shepherds to the manger of Christ, that is, his church. And as he lay in that manger in swaddling clothes, so in the sacred scriptures we shall find our Saviour. Let us also with a lively recollection of the words of this mystery, like Mary, the blessed mother of our Lord, keep pondering them continually in our hearts. Let us with glad voices join in the angel's song, and render unto the Lord the thanks due unto his name for his marvellous benefits to us. Let us rejoice and shout for joy with the whole multitude of the heavenly host. For if the angels rejoiced so greatly on our account, how much more ought we rejoice to whom this child is born, to whom this son is given? If the Israelites lifted up their voices in jubilant shouts when the Ark of the Covenant was brought back to them, which was a type and a shadow of the incarnation of our dear Lord, how much more ought we rejoice, since our Lord himself hath come down to us in the assumption of our human nature? If Abraham rejoiced to see the day of the Lord, when the Lord, assuming at that time bodily shape, appeared to him, what ought we to do, seeing that our Lord hath taken our nature into perpetual and indissoluble union with himself? Let us admire the marvellous goodness of our God, who, when we could not ascend to him, hesitated not to descend to us. Let us stand in wonder at the marvellous power of our God, who was able to unite in one two natures so diverse as the divine and human, so that one and the same person is now both God and man. Let us admire the marvellous wisdom of our God, who could devise a scheme for our redemption which neither angels nor men could have devised. Infinite good was offended, 
and infinite satisfaction was required. Man had offended God. From man the satisfaction for sin must be required. But finite man could not possibly render an infinite satisfaction, nor could divine justice be satisfied by the payment of an infinite ransom. For this reason God became man, that for man who had sinned he might render a perfect satisfaction for sin, and as God who is infinite he might pay an infinite price for our redemption. Well may we wonder at this stupendous reconciliation of divine justice and mercy, which no one before God was manifest in the flesh could have devised, nor after he was so manifested could fully comprehend. Let us stand in wonder at this mystery, but let us not too curiously pry into it. Let us desire reverently to study it, although we cannot fully understand it. Rather, let us confess our ignorance than deny the power of God. End of Meditation 14Meditation 15 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Saving Benefits of Christ's Incarnation Let us be deeply grateful for the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, said the angel at the birth of our Saviour. Great indeed is the joy thus announced, ay, greater than the human mind can conceive. It was a dreadful thing for us to lie under the holy wrath of God, to be led captive by the devil at his will, and to be under sentence of eternal condemnation. But it was still more dreadful that men were ignorant of their awful condition, or utterly indifferent to it. And now the angel brings the good tidings, that he hath come into the world who will free us from all these evils. He came as the physician to the spiritually sick, as the redeemer to the captives of sin, as the way to those who had wandered afar off, as the life to the dead in trespasses and sins, and as a saviour to the lost. As Moses was sent by the Lord to deliver the Israelites from the bondage of Egypt, so was Christ sent by the Father to redeem mankind from the bondage of the devil. As the dove, after the waters of the flood had abated from the face of the earth, brought back an olive leaf to Noah in the ark, so Christ came to earth to preach peace and reconciliation between man and God. Well may we rejoice, then, and magnify the mercy of our God. What good thing will he who loved us while we were yet his enemies disdaining not to take our human nature into the very closest union with his divinity, withhold from those who are partakers with him of the same flesh. Who has ever hated his own flesh? How can he possibly cast this off, when by an exercise of such exalted and infinite mercy he hath made us partakers of his own nature? Who in most exalted thought can reach this stupendous mystery, much less express it in words? Here we have the most exalted sublimity and the basest vileness, the greatest power and the most abject helplessness, the most glorious majesty and the most inglorious weakness. What can be more sublime than God or viler than man? Who hath more power than God or greater moral helplessness than man? Who can be so glorious as God and so weak as man? But that sublime power devises a plan of redemption which unites all these elements when infinite justice required such a union. What finite man can grasp the greatness of this mystery? An adequate ransom, infinite in value, was demanded for man's offense, because man had turned himself away from God the infinite good. But what could be an adequate satisfaction to an infinite God? Therefore, Infinite justice takes from itself, as it were, an adequate satisfaction offered by itself. And God, the Creator, suffers in human flesh, lest man, the work of his hands, should suffer eternally. Infinite good was offended, and no one but a mediator of infinite power could intercede for us. And who is infinite but God only? 
Hence, God reconciled the world unto himself. God himself became the mediator. God himself redeemed mankind with his own blood. Who can understand this marvellous mystery? The Almighty Creator had been offended, and yet the creature who had committed the offence manifested no anxiety for a propitiation or reconciliation. But he who had been offended assumed our flesh to make reconciliation for us. Man had forsaken God and allied himself to the devil, God's bitter enemy. And yet he who had been thus deserted, with tender concern, seeks the deserter and most graciously begs him to return to him again. Man had gone away from infinite goodness itself, and had fallen into infinite depths of evil. But that very infinite goodness, having paid an infinite price for his redemption, rescues him from those infinite depths of evil. Oh, does not this infinite mercy exceed the highest thought of the finite human mind? Christ hath brought to our poor human nature a greater glory than it lost by Adam's sin. In Christ we receive more than we lost in Adam. Where sin had abounded, divine grace hath much more abounded. In Adam we lost our primal innocence. In Christ we receive a full and completed righteousness. Some may justly regard the power of God as wonderful, but still more wonderful is His grace although so far as God is concerned they are equally wonderful, because both are infinite. Others may admire the wondrous power of God in creation, but still more may we admire the marvels of His grace in redemption, although both creation and redemption alike manifest His infinite power. It was a great thing to create man in the first place, when, as yet not existing, he could deserve neither good nor ill at God's hands. But to redeem man, when he justly merited condemnation, and to take upon himself the punishment due for man's transgression, that seems to me a still greater thing. It is truly wonderful when we consider how God hath formed us in our flesh and our bones, but it is still more wonderful to think how he was willing to become flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone. O my soul, give unceasing thanks to God who created thee, when as yet thou hadst no being, who redeemed thee, when through sin thou wast under eternal condemnation, and who hath prepared for thee joys unspeakable and full of glory, if thou by faith dost cling to Christ thy Saviour. End of Meditation 15《Sacred Meditations》by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Spiritual Refreshment of the Godly What is God to the soul? He is its light, its healing balm, its bread of life. God hath most graciously prepared a great supper, but those who would enjoy it must come with hearts hungering and thirsting after righteousness. He who tastes not perceives not the sweetness of this heavenly feast, and he who does not hunger for it does not taste it. To believe in Christ is to come to this heavenly banquet. But no one can believe in Christ who does not acknowledge his sins in true contrition and penitence. Contrition is the spiritual hunger of our souls, and by faith our souls are spiritually fed. The Lord God fed the Israelites in the wilderness with manna, angel's food, but in this blessed feast of the new covenant god feeds our souls with heavenly manna that is the pardon of our sins nay more with the body and blood of his own son who is the lord of the angels christ is the living bread who came down from heaven that he might give life to the world one who fills himself with the husks that the swine eat that is with the carnal delights of this world cares not for the blessedness of this spiritual feast the carnal mind has no conception of that which is true blessedness to the soul. In this wilderness world, God feeds our souls with his own manna, when earthly sustenance fails us, and when every earthly comfort departs. Those who had just married wives, in the parable, were backward in coming to the supper. But souls that are not joined to the devil through sin, nor allied to the world through its pleasures, hasten to this gospel feast. 
I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, says the Apostle. We must keep our souls from all unholy alliance with the world, if God is to espouse us to himself in this spiritual union. Those who, in the parable of the supper, were occupied with looking after their newly purchased lands, also refused a kind invitation. And those engrossed in the pleasures of this world have no longings after the blessedness of the heavenly banquet. Desire is the food of the soul. Our souls do not come to this mystical feast if they have no desire for it. And a soul that places its happiness in the comforts of this world cannot desire the heavenly delights of the gospel. When the rich young man heard that he must give up the earthly riches in which his soul delighted if he would follow Christ, he went away sorrowful. Christ, our heavenly Elijah, does not pour the oil of heavenly grace into any vessel that is not first entirely emptied. And the love of God does not take possession of any soul from which the love of self and the love of the world have not first been excluded. Where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. If the world is thy treasure, thy heart is in the world. Love has a uniting power. If thou lovest earthly things, thou wilt be joined to earthly things. Love has an assimilating power. If thou lovest the world, thou wilt become worldly. If thou lovest heavenly things, thou wilt become heavenly-minded. In the parable, those who traded in oxen and merchandise did not come to Christ. Those who set their hearts upon earthly riches do not seek the heavenly. Earthly riches seem for a time to satisfy the desires of the soul, so that it does not seek in God that which alone would afford it full and perfect satisfaction. The riches of the world consist in material things as silver and gold, houses and lands, flocks and herds. But no material thing can possibly satisfy the longings of the soul, which is far more excellent than any material object. For all these have been created for the use and benefit of the soul. How utterly material things fail to meet and satisfy the needs of the soul appears in death when we must give them all up. It is passing strange that we should set our minds upon these earthly possessions when our hold upon them is so frail and short-lived. When Adam forsook the comforts afforded him in God and sought delight through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he was driven out of paradise. So our souls, if they turn from God the Creator to the creature, are deprived of heavenly comforts and shall be forever driven away from the tree of life. But what remains to those who neglect this heavenly feast? The world passeth away, and the lust thereof, and so shall all they who set their hearts upon it. All created things shall perish, and so shall they who rest their hopes in them. God declares that those who prefer the possessions and pleasures of this life to the blessings and comforts of his heavenly feast shall not taste of his supper. If the supper be neglected, the hungry must go unfed. And if Christ be rejected, there remaineth no more remedy for sin. Those who despise the invitation shall suffer the pangs of eternal hunger, and shall dwell for ever in the outer darkness. Those who refused to heed the word of Christ, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, shall one day hear that dreaded word, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. The Sodomites were consumed by fire sent down from heaven, when, graciously invited to this heavenly feast of good things, through the preaching of Lot, they willfully refused to come. And so those who have insolently spurned the gospel invitation shall be consumed by the fires of divine wrath, that shall burn for ever and ever. The five foolish virgins who went out to meet the bridegroom without taking oil in their vessels with them, framed various excuses for their delay. But meanwhile, the door was shut. And so those whose hearts are not filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit in this world will not be admitted by Christ into a participation of his heavenly joy, but will find that the door of long-suffering, the door of mercy, the door of everlasting consolation, the door of hope, the door of grace, the door of good works, 
shall be fast shut against them. Besides this, there is an inward call of Christ to our souls, and blessed is he who heeds it. Christ often knocks at the door of our hearts with holy longings, devout aspirations, pious meditations, and blessed is he who throws wide open his heart's door to the Christ. As soon as thou dost experience in thy heart some longing after the grace of God, thou mayest certainly conclude that it is Christ knocking at the door of thy heart. O oh, admit him, lest he pass by, and afterwards close against thee the door of his mercy. As soon as thou perceivest in thy heart the faintest spark of pious thoughts, conclude at once it was enkindled by the fervour of God's love through the Holy Spirit. O oh, feed and keep alive that holy flame, that it may kindle into a growing fire of love for God. O oh, beware, lest thou quench the Holy Spirit, and hinder the Lord's work in thy soul. He who destroys the temple of God shall suffer the severest judgment of God. Our heart is the temple of God, and that we destroy when we refuse to heed the inward call of the Holy Spirit through God's word. The prophets of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, but now under the gospel all the truly pious feel the inward motions and drawings of the Holy Spirit. Blessed indeed are all they who hear and follow him. End of Meditation 16Meditation 17 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Benefits of Baptism Baptism is a holy washing. Call to mind, O faithful soul, the wonderful grace of God bestowed upon thee in holy baptism. Baptism is the washing of regeneration. Therefore he who hath been spiritually washed in the labor of baptism is no longer held body and soul under the power of a carnal nature. But because he hath been born again of God through water and the Spirit, he is a son of God, and if a son, then an heir of eternal blessedness. As the Eternal Father at the baptism of Christ declared, This is my beloved Son, so all who believe and are baptized receive the adoption of sons. As the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove at Christ's baptism, so he is also present at our baptism, and gives it all its efficacy, nay, more, communicates himself to believing souls in this holy ordinance, and so worketh in them that they become wise as serpents and harmless as doves. As it was at the creation, so is it at our regeneration. For as at the creation of the world the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the waters and imparted to them a vital energy, so in the water of baptism the same Holy Spirit is present to render it efficacious for our regeneration. Our beloved Saviour, Christ himself, submitted to baptism that he might make it plain that through baptism we are to be made members of his body. Often a remedy is applied to the head that other parts of the body may be healed. Our spiritual head is Christ, and he submitted to holy baptism that the members of his mystical body might enjoy its saving benefits. Under the old economy, God entered into covenant with his people by circumcision. So in the new economy, we are received into covenant relations with God by baptism, because baptism has superseded circumcision. Let not him who is in covenant with God fear the devil. Those who are baptized into Christ put on Christ, and thus the saints are said to have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The perfect righteousness of Christ is the glorious robe of his saints. Let not him, therefore, who is clothed in this robe fear the least spot of sin. There was at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, into which at certain times an angel went down and troubled the water. Whosoever then, first after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatever disease he had. The water of baptism is that pool which heals us of the malady of sin, when the Holy Spirit descends into it and troubles it, as it were, with the blood of Christ who gave himself as a sacrifice for us, just as the sacrificial lambs were washed in that pool at Jerusalem. At Christ's baptism the heavens were opened, 
so at our baptism the gates of heaven are opened to our souls. At the baptism of Christ, all three persons of the adorable Trinity were present, so they are at our baptism. And so, in that word of promise which is united to the element of water, faith receives the grace of the Heavenly Father who adopts us, the merit of the Blessed Son who cleanses us from sin, and the efficacious working of the Holy Spirit who regenerates us. Pharaoh and all his host perished in the Red Sea, while the Israelites passed over safely. Thus in baptism all our sins are destroyed, and the believing soul passes safely over to the promised inheritance of the heavenly kingdom. Baptism may be likened to that sea of glass likened to crystal, which St. John saw in his wonderful vision. Through it, as through a glass, the glory of the Son of Righteousness shines into our souls. But that sea was before the throne of the Lamb. That throne of the Lamb is the church, in which alone the grace of baptism is deposited. The prophet Ezekiel, in his vision, saw waters issue from under the temple, which carry life and healing to all things. So in God's spiritual temple, the church, the saving waters of baptism are still streaming forth, into whose depths our sins are cast, and whose streams bring spiritual healing and life unto all to whom they come. Baptism is that spiritual flood in which our sinful flesh is drowned. The foul raven, the devil, departs not to return, but the dove, the Holy Spirit, returns with the olive leaf, that is, with peace and quietness, to the weary soul. Call to mind, therefore, O faithful soul, this wonderful peace offered to thee in baptism, and for it give due thanks to God. Moreover, the more richly blessed the baptismal grace bestowed upon thee, the more carefully thou shouldest guard it. We are buried with Christ by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We have been made whole, therefore let us sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon us. We have put on the righteousness of Christ, a garment of inexpressible preciousness, therefore let us not defile it with sin. Our old man was crucified and put to death in baptism. Let the new man now live. We have been regenerated and renewed in the spirit of our mind in baptism. Let not the flesh then rule the spirit. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let not then the oldness of the flesh prevail over the newness of the Spirit. We have become the sons of God by our new spiritual birth. Let us live worthily, therefore, of our Heavenly Father. We have become temples of the Holy Spirit. Let us therefore prepare an abode that will be pleasing to such an honored guest. We have been taken into the covenant relation with God. Let us take heed, therefore, that we do not serve the devil, and so deprive ourselves of the grace of this covenant. O thou most blessed Trinity, accomplish all this in our souls, we humbly pray thee. O thou one only God, who has bestowed thy grace upon us in baptism, help us, we beseech thee, to persevere in that grace unto the end. End of Meditation 17。Meditation 18 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Saving Communion of the Body and Blood of Christ. The flesh of Christ is life to the soul. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, says our Lord Jesus Christ. Marvelous is the goodness of our Savior, that he not only assumed our human nature in his incarnation, and carried it with him to his throne of heavenly glory, but that he also gives us his own body and blood to nourish our souls unto eternal life. O oh, the delightful blessings which he here offers to my soul! O oh, the glorious repast! for which I so ardently long. O oh, the heavenly and angelic food of this holy supper of our Lord! Though the angels desire to look into this great mystery, yet, 
Christ took not on him the nature of angels, but the seed of Abraham. Our Saviour is more nearly allied to us than to the angels themselves, and by this we know that he loveth us, because he hath given us of his Spirit, and not of his Spirit only, but of his own body and blood as well. For so Christ, himself the truth, speaks of the Eucharistic bread and wine, this is my body, this is my blood. How can the Lord ever forget those whom he has redeemed, those whom he hath nourished with his own body and blood? He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in them. I do not greatly wonder, in view of all of this, that the very hairs of our heads are all numbered, that our names are written in heaven, that we are graven upon the palms of the Lord's hands, that we are carried in his bosom, since we are fed with Christ's precious body and blood. Inexpressibly great must be the value of our souls, since they are fed with the precious ransom of their own redemption. Great indeed is the honor put upon our bodies, inasmuch as they are the dwelling places of our souls, redeemed and fed by the body of Christ, and are the temples of the Holy Ghost, and the abodes of the adorable Trinity. It cannot be that they should ever remain in the grave, since they are thus nourished with the body and blood of the Lord. He is the wonderful bread of life. We partake of it and become one body with Christ. We are members of Christ. We are animated by His Spirit. We are nourished with His body and blood. He is the bread of God which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world, of which if any man eat he shall never hunger. He is the bread of grace and mercy, of which if any man eat he tastes and sees that the Lord is good, and of his fullness receives grace for grace. He is the bread of life, not only living, but life-giving, so that he that eateth of him shall live for ever. This is the bread which came down from heaven, nor is it only heavenly in its own nature, but to all those who partake of it in the Spirit and with saving faith, it will give a place among the heavenly guests at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Aye, heavenly guests they shall be, because they shall never die, but be raised up at the last day. And yet they shall not be raised to judgment, because they who eat of this bread shall not come to judgment nor to condemnation, for there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But they shall arise to life and eternal salvation. For whosoever eateth the flesh of the Son of Man, and drinketh his blood, hath life in himself, and shall live by Christ. His flesh is meat indeed, and his blood is drink indeed. Let us not seek, then, to feast our souls on our own dead works, but with the blessed food of the Lord's own providing. Let us not try to satisfy them with the perishing things of the earth, but with the fatness of the house of the Lord. He is the true fountain of life. Whosoever drinketh of the water that Jesus will give him, it shall be in him a well of water, springing up into eternal life. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Let all those that are athirst come, and come thou, O my thirsty soul, who art tormented with the scorching heat of thy sins. What if thou hast no money, no merit of thine own to offer? Then hasten all the more to this refreshing fountain. If thou hast no merit of thine own, then hasten all the more eagerly to the saving merit of Christ thy Saviour. Fly hither, then, and buy without money and without price. Here is the place of rest for Christ and the soul, from which our sins may not deter us, nor will our merits help us to attain it. But what can our merits do for us? Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not, saith the prophet? We cannot satisfy our souls by our own works, nor purchase divine grace by our own merits. Then hearken diligently, O my soul, and eat that which is good, and delight thyself in fatness. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. And these are the words of eternal life. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? 
the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? We cling unto the Lord, and thus we are one spirit with him. We are united to him not only because he hath assumed our nature, but also because his body and blood are communicated to us in the Holy Supper. I do not therefore ask with the unbelieving Jews, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? But I rather exclaim, how marvellous it is that the Lord hath given us his body to eat and his blood to drink. I do not pry into the mysteries of his power, but I do wonder at the marvels of his mercy. I do not curiously inquire into his glorious majesty, but I do humbly adore his boundless goodness. In his actual presence in the Holy Supper I profoundly believe, though of the mode of that presence I am ignorant. And yet I do certainly know that it is of the closest and most intimate character. We are members of his body, flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. My soul desires to be swallowed up in the contemplation of this profoundest mystery. Words fail me to set forth or properly express this great goodness of the Lord. I am utterly dumbfounded at the thought of the marvelous grace of the Lord and the glory that awaits his saints. End of Meditation 18Meditation 19 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhard, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mystery of the Lord's Supper To stand in wonder before it, not to pry into it, is truest wisdom. In the Holy Supper of our Lord, we have a mystery placed before us that should cause the deepest awe and excite our profoundest adoration. There is the treasury and storehouse of God's grace. We know that the tree of life was planted by God in paradise, that its fruits might preserve our first parents and their posterity in the blessedness of an immortality which had been bestowed upon them at their creation. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was also placed in paradise, but that which God gave them for their salvation and eternal life, and to serve as a test of their obedience, became an occasion of their death and eternal condemnation when they miserably yielded to Satan's enticements and followed their own sinful desires. So in this holy supper we have the true tree of life again set before us, the sweet tree, whose leaves are for medicine and whose fruit is for salvation. Ay, its sweetness is such as to destroy the bitterness of all afflictions, and even of death itself. The Israelites were fed with manna in the wilderness, as the bread from heaven. In this holy supper we have the true manna which came down from heaven to give life unto the world. Here is that bread of heaven, that angel's food, of which, if any man eat, he shall never hunger. The children of Israel had the ark of the covenant and the mercy seat, where they could hear the Lord speaking with them face to face. But here we have the true Ark of the Covenant, the most holy body of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Here we have the true mercy seat in the precious blood of Christ, through which God hath made us accepted in our Beloved. Nor does Christ simply speak the word of comfort to our souls. He also takes up his abode in us, he feeds our souls not with heavenly manna but what is far better with his own blessed self here is the true gate of heaven to our souls and the ladder reaching from earth to heaven on which the angels of god ascend and descend for is not he who is in heaven greater than the heavens can heaven be as close to god as the flesh and the human nature which he assumed in the incarnation Heaven is indeed the dwelling place of God, and yet the Holy Spirit dwells upon the human nature assumed by Christ. God is in heaven, and yet in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Truly this is a great and infallible pledge of our salvation. He could not possibly have given us a greater, for what is greater than himself? What can be more intimately united to the Lord than his own human nature, which he hath taken in his incarnation into fellowship with the adorable Trinity, 
and thus made the treasury of all the blessings that heaven has to bestow. What is so intimately joined to him as his own body and blood? With this truly heavenly food he refreshes our souls, who are as miserable worms of the dust before him, and makes us partakers of his own nature. Why then shall we not enjoy his gracious favor? Who ever yet hated his own flesh? How then can the Lord hate us, to whom he giveth his body to eat and his blood to drink? How can he possibly forget those to whom he hath given the pledge of his own body? How can Satan gain the victory over us when we are strengthened and made meet for our spiritual conflicts with the bread of heaven? Christ holds us dear because he hath bought us at so dear a price. He holds us dear because he feeds our souls with so dear and precious a food. He holds us dear because we are members of his body, of his flesh. This is the only sovereign remedy for all the diseases of our souls. Here is the only efficacious remedy for mortality. For what sin is so heinous but the sacred flesh of God may expiate it? What sin is so great but it may be healed by the life-giving flesh of the Christ? What sin so deadly in its effect but it may be atoned for by the death of the Son of God? What darts of the devil, so fiery, that they may be quenched at this fountain of divine grace? What conscience is so stained with sin, but it may be cleansed by the blood of Christ? The Lord journeyed with the Israelites of old in a pillar of cloud and fire. But here we have present with us not a cloud, but the Son of Righteousness himself, the blessed light of our souls. Here we are sensible not of the fire of the divine wrath, but of the glowing flame of divine love, which does not withdraw afar off from us, but comes and makes its abode with us. Our first parents were placed in paradise, that most charming and delightful garden, the type of the eternal blessedness of the heavenly paradise, that being mindful of God's goodness to them, they might render due obedience to their Creator. But behold in this holy supper more than a paradise. For here the soul of the creature is spiritually fed with the flesh of his almighty creator. The conscience is cleansed from all its guilty stains in the blood of the Son of God. The members of Christ, their spiritual head, are nourished with his own body. The believing soul feasts itself at a divine and heavenly banquet. The holy flesh of God which the angelic hosts adore in the unity of the divine nature, before which archangels bow in lowly reverence, and before which the principalities and powers of heaven tremble and stand in awe, is become the spiritual nourishment of our souls. Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad, but still more, let the believing soul exult and sing for joy, to whom God hath given such an unspeakable gift. End of Meditation 19。Meditation 20 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A serious preparation for the Holy Supper. Be thou a worthy guest of Christ in his Holy Supper. This holy supper is no common meal, nor is it the banquet of an earthly king. But here we have placed before us the holy mystery of the body and blood of Christ in which we are to participate. Certainly, then, a worthy preparation is needful, that we may not, unworthily eating of it, find death instead of life, and receive judgment instead of mercy. How the holy patriarch trembles, how he fears, although so remarkable for the strength of his faith, when the Son of God in human form appears to him and announces the impending destruction of Sodom. But here the Lamb of God is set forth before us, and that not to be curiously gazed upon, but to be tasted and eaten. When Uzziah rashly and inconsiderately drew near to the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord immediately smote him with leprosy. What wonder that he who eateth of this bread and drinketh of this wine unworthily should eat and drink to his condemnation? For here is the true Ark of the Covenant, 
of which the old was only a type. The Apostle tells us in one word what constitutes true preparation. Let a man examine himself, he says, and so let him eat of that bread. But as every holy examination must be made according to the rule of holy scripture, so it is in the case of this which Paul requires. Let us consider then, first of all, our human weakness and imperfection. What is man? Naught but dust and ashes. Of the earth we are born, from the earth we derive our sustenance, to the earth we shall return again. What is man? A foul seed, a mass of corruption, and by and by to be food of worms. Man is born to labor, not to honor. Man that is born of a woman, and on that account with guilt, is of few days. His life is passed in fear, filled as it is with many miseries, and hence with weeping. Truly, with many miseries, because both his body and his soul are sorely afflicted. Man is ignorant alike of his origin and of his end. Our life is like a summer plant, soon withered, and yet this brief life is filled with labors and pains that are by no means brief. Let us consider, in the second place, our unworthiness. Every creature, indeed, compared with the Creator, is a shadow, a sleep, a nothing, and no less so is man. But man is unworthy in very many and more grievous ways, for by his sins he has offended his Creator. God is by nature and essence just. Hence, in his nature and essence, he is righteously offended at sin. And what are we but as stubble for his consuming fire? How can our abominable wickedness stand in his sight? How can our iniquities, which thou hast set before thee, and our errors, which thou hast set in the light of thy countenance, endure the blaze of thy holiness? God is infinite and always acts consistently with his own character. His justice and his holy wrath against sin are alike infinite. And if he is great and truly marvelous in all his works, certainly is he also in wrath, in justice, in vengeance. Will he who spared not his own Son spare the work of his hands? Will he who spared not his most holy Son spare a worthless and insignificant servant? So utterly hateful is sin to God that he punishes it even more in those most dear to him, as is manifest in the case of Lucifer, the chief of the fallen angels. And in our preparation for this holy supper, let us not simply examine ourselves, but let us also consider this blessed bread, which is the communion of the body of Christ, and then it will appear to us as a true fountain of God's grace and an inexhaustible spring of divine mercy. Truly the Lord could not turn away his face from us, whom he hath graciously made partakers of his own flesh, for who ever yet hated his own flesh? Thus this holy supper will transform our souls. This most divine sacrament will make us divine men, till finally we shall enter upon the fullness of the blessedness that is to come, fulfilled with all the fullness of God, and holy like Him. What we have here only by faith and in a mystery, there we shall enjoy in reality and openly. These bodies of ours, which are now the temples of the Holy Spirit, and are sanctified and quickened by the body and blood of Christ dwelling in them, shall be crowned with this glory, that in them we shall see God face to face. This holy remedy heals all the gaping wounds that sin hath made. This life-giving body of the Son of God overcomes every deadly sin. This is the sacred seal of the divine promises, which by God's grace we may exhibit at the time of judgment. In the sure and sufficient pledge of eternal life thus given to us do we glory. If the body and blood of Christ are thus communicated to us, certainly we shall enjoy all the blessings acquired through that most holy body and that blessed blood. How will he who hath given us the greater blessings deny us the lesser? He that spared not his own son, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Rejoice thou, O my soul, thou espoused bride of Christ, 
for the time is fast drawing near that thou shalt be called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Put on thy precious robes, take thou the wedding garment provided for thee, lest when he come in he find thee unprepared to receive him. That robe is the righteousness of thy spouse, Jesus Christ, which we put on in holy baptism. Our own righteousness is so far from being the wedding garment that it is nothing less than filthy rags before God. O let us greatly fear to come to that solemn marriage supper of the Lamb, clad in the miserable and filthy garments of our own works. But clothe thou us, O Lord, lest in that day we be found naked. End of Meditation 20Meditation 21 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ascension of Christ To ascend with Christ is our blessed privilege. Meditate, O faithful soul, upon the ascension of thy Lord. Christ withdrew his visible bodily presence from us, that faith in him might have more abundant exercise. For blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. Christ, our treasure, is in heaven. Let us then set our affections upon heavenly things, or meditate upon those things that are above. The expectant bride awaits the coming of her spouse with the most ardent longings. So let the devout soul ever longingly await the coming of that day when she shall be admitted to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let her confidently rest in the pledge of the Holy Spirit, whom the Lord, when he ascended to heaven, sent as the Comforter. Let her trust in the merits of the body and blood of her Lord, which she receives in the Holy Supper. And let her firmly believe that our bodies, nourished with this heavenly food, shall some day rise again from the dead. What we now believe, we then shall see. What we now hope for, we then shall enjoy in glad reality. As we journey here as pilgrims, the Lord is present with us, but in another and invisible form. In our home in the heavenly fatherland above, we shall know him, for we shall see him as he is. Our Savior chose to ascend to heaven from the Mount of Olives. The olive branch is the emblem of peace and joy. It was fitting, therefore, that he who through his bitter passion brings peace to terrified and troubled consciences, and is received into the skies with most jubilant joy by the heavenly hosts, should ascend from the mount called the Mount of Olives. That sacred mount impressively calls us to the heavenly things. Let us heed the call, and follow on with holy desires, since we may not follow with bodily feet. Moses, in like manner, went up into the mountain to speak with the Lord. In the mountain the holy patriarchs of old worshipped the Lord. Abraham chose the mountainous district, while Lot chose the plain of Jordan. Let the faithful soul forsake the low-lying plains of this world, and seek with holy devotion those heavenly heights. Thus shall she enjoy the most blessed communion with God. Thus shall she be able to worship God in spirit and in truth. Thus shall she, with faithful Abraham, escape the eternal burnings that shall overtake the plains of worldliness. Bethany signifies the village of humility and affliction, through which the way of the eternal kingdom lies open to us, just as Christ, through the severest sufferings, entered into his glory. Hitherto heaven seemed to be closed to our souls, and the paradise above guarded with a flaming sword. But now our triumphant Lord throws wide open the gates of heaven to us, that he may lead us back into our heavenly fatherland, from which by our sins we are excluded. But now our triumphant Lord throws wide open the gates of heaven to us, that he may lead us back into our heavenly fatherland, the enraptured disciples stand gazing up into heaven. So let all true disciples of Christ lift up their souls to the contemplation of things heavenly and divine. O blessed Lord Jesus, how gloriously hath thy passion ended! What a blessed and sudden transformation is here! 
ah in what awful anguish i saw thee upon mount calvary and now in what glory i behold thee upon mount olivet there thou didst suffer alone here thou art attended by a vast multitude of the angelic hosts there thou didst descend to the cross here thou dost descend in a cloud to heaven there thou wast crucified between two thieves here thou dost exult among angelic choirs there thou wast nailed to the cross as a condemned criminal here free from all condemnation thou art the deliverer of those condemned to eternal death there thou didst bleed and die here thou dost rejoice and triumph christ is our glorious head we are the members of his body rejoice thou and shout for joy o faithful soul in the ascension to heaven of thy head the glory of thy head is the glory also of the members where our flesh reigns there let us believe that we too shall reign where our blood rules there let us hope that we too shall be glorious though our sins would forbid this yet our participation in his holy nature makes it possible where the head is there shall also the other members of the body be christ our head hath gone into the heavens hence the other members of the body with good reason hope to enter heaven and not only so but even now already have a possession in heaven christ came from heaven for our redemption he returns thither for our glorification he was born in the flesh for us he suffered for us and therefore he ascended for us the passion of christ wins our love the resurrection of christ strengthens our faith the ascension of christ confirms our hope we ought however to follow our heavenly bridegroom not only in ardent desires but also in good works into the celestial day shall enter nothing that defileth in token of which angels appeared at christ's ascension as coming from the heavenly jerusalem and clothed in white apparel as tokens of innocence and purity pride cannot ascend to heaven with the great master of humility nor evil with the author of all goodness nor discord with the prince of peace nor lust and wantonness with the son of the virgin nor vice with the parent of all virtue nor sin with the holy one nor our sinful infirmities with the great physician does any one desire to behold god in the future life let him live worthily in the sight of god in this life does any one hope for the blessedness of heaven by and by let him love not the world now o blessed lord jesus draw our hearts after thee we beseech thee End of Meditation 21meditation 22 of sacred meditations by johann gerhardt translated by c w heisler this librivox recording is in the public domain the holy spirit god seals his elect with his holy spirit after our lord had ascended to heaven and entered into his glory he sent the holy spirit upon his disciples on the day of pentecost under the old economy when god delivered the law in mount sinai he descended from heaven and appeared to his servant Moses. So, when the gospel was to be preached in all the world by the apostles, the Holy Spirit descended upon the waiting apostles. There, on Sinai, there were thunders and lightnings, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, because the law thunders against our disobedience, and convicts us of sin, and as under the blazing wrath of God. But here, on Pentecost, is the sound of of a gently murmuring wind for the reason that the proclamation of the gospel brings good cheer to our terrified minds there alarm and terror seized all the people because the law worketh wrath but here the whole multitude came together to hear the wonderful things of god because the gospel reveals to men the way of approach to god on sinai jehovah descended in fire but in the fire of holy wrath and indignation against sin and the whole mountain quaked greatly and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a great furnace but here on the day of pentecost jehovah the holy spirit also descends in fire but in the fire of love 
and holy affection, so that the house where the disciples were sitting is not shaken with any manifestations of the divine wrath, but the whole house is filled with the manifested glory of the Holy Spirit. What wonder is it that the Holy Spirit is sent from heaven to sanctify us, when the Son of God had already been sent to redeem us? All the bitter suffering of Christ would have been of no avail if the glad tidings of the gospel were not made known to the world. For of what advantage is a hidden treasure? Thus our most merciful Holy Father has not only prepared a great benefit in the passion of His Son, Jesus Christ, but also desired to offer to the whole world and make effective that grace by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Our faithful God withholds nothing from us, but sends both His Son and His Spirit to provide for the salvation of us miserable sinners. The Holy Spirit, moreover, descended upon the apostles while they were continuing with one accord in prayer. For the spirit of prayer is prevailed upon by prayer, and he it is who leads us to pray. And wherefore? Because he is the bond that unites our hearts to God, just as he unites the Son with the Father, and the Father with the Son. For he is the mutual essential love between the Father and the Son. This spiritual union between God and our souls follows upon faith. But faith, the gift of the Spirit, is obtained by prayer, and true prayer is prompted by the Holy Spirit. When incense was offered to the Lord at the dedication of Solomon's temple, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Thus, if thou dost offer unto God the incense of prayer and supplication, the Holy Spirit will fill with His glory the temple of thy heart. O oh, let us admire the mercy and the grace of our God. God the Father promises to hear us when we pray. God the Son himself maketh intercessions for us. And God the Holy Spirit indicts our prayers and prays in us. Holy angels carry our prayers to God, and thus every avenue to the throne of heavenly grace is open to our prayers. The merciful God gives us the disposition to pray, because He bestows upon us the spirit of grace and of prayer. He also makes our prayers effectual, because He always hears them and answers them, if not according to our desire, yet according to our need. The Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples when they were all gathered together with one accord in one place. Without doubt, then, He is the spirit of love and of concord. He unites us to Christ through faith. He makes God one with us through love. He joins us to our neighbor in Christian affection. The devil is the author of discord. He makes a gulf between us and God by sin and by hatred. Contention and strife causes unhappy divisions among men. But as the Holy Spirit united the divine and human natures in Christ by His overshadowing power, so also by the outpouring of His gracious gifts upon us, he unites us to God, and God to us. As long as the Holy Spirit abides in a man, filling him with his gracious gifts, so long does that man abide in a holy union with God. And just as soon as a man through sin falls away from faith and love, and banishes the Holy Spirit from his heart, he is alienated from God, and the blessed union between God and his soul is destroyed. He who hath the Holy Spirit hateth not his brother. And why? Because by the Holy Spirit he is made a partaker of the mystical body of Christ, whose members include all godly souls. But who ever yet hated the members of his own body? Nay, more, he who is ruled by the Spirit of God will even love his enemies, because he who is joined unto the Lord is made one spirit with him. God maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and hateth nothing that he hath made. He who has the Spirit of God is ready to serve all who need his help. He does good to all men as far as in him lies. He spends himself for the good of others. And all this because God is the fountain of all compassion and grace towards all men. Now, the Holy Spirit excites his own peculiar impulses and emotions in men. Just as the soul makes the body living, sentient, active, 
so the Holy Spirit makes a man spiritual. He fills our minds with heavenly delights, and directs the whole man in rendering obedience to God and in his duty to his fellow man. That sound, the symbol of the Holy Spirit, came from heaven, because the Holy Spirit is heavenly in his nature, being of the same essence with the Father and the Son, and proceeding from all eternity from the Father and the Son. He it is who leads us to think upon heavenly things, and to seek those things that are above. He who sets his affection upon the world and worldly things has not yet been made a partaker of the heavenly spirit. The Holy Spirit came under the emblem of a breath of air, because he imparts living consolation to afflicted souls, and because by an alternate inspiration and expiration, or a breath of air, we sustain this present bodily life. So, he came under the emblem of a breath, and of a breathing, who alone gives us the power to live the spiritual life. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. It was appropriate that he should come like unto wind, since he proceeds from the Father and the Son by an eternal breath. The sound came as of a rushing, mighty wind, figuring thus the power of the Holy Spirit's gracious work in our hearts. This Holy Spirit impels the godly to every good work, and so influences and controls them that they regard not the tyrant's threats, nor Satan's snares, nor the world's hatred. He confers upon the apostles the gift of tongues, because their sound is to go out into all the earth. And thus the confusion of tongues, inflicted as a punishment upon the proud and rash builders of the Tower of Babel, was removed, and the natives of the earth, scattered and separated through diversity of language, are brought together in the unity of faith, through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Fitly did he come under the figure of tongues, moved by whom holy men of God spoke in old time, who spake through the holy apostles, and who now puts the word of God into the mouth of the ministers of the church. For so many and so great gifts, let the Holy Spirit with the Father and the Son be praised and magnified for ever and ever. End of Meditation 22Meditation 23 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Dignity of the Church The Church is Christ's Bride. Consider, O devout soul, how greatly God hath loved thee in calling thee into the fellowship of his Church. My beloved is one, says the Bridegroom in Canticles 6 1. Truly one seeing that there is but one true and orthodox church, the beloved bride of Christ. Out of the body of Christ, or the church, we may not look for the spirit of Christ. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And he who is not Christ's cannot be a partaker of eternal life. All those who were not admitted into Noah's ark perished miserably in the flood. And so all outside the spiritual ark of the church are involved in eternal destruction. No man will have God for his father in heaven, who refuses to have the church for his mother upon the earth. Just think, O devout soul, of the many thousands who go down to hell every day, for the reason that they are outside the bosom of the church. And it is not thy nature, but only the grace of a merciful God that makes thee different from them. When Egypt lay in thick darkness, there was light only among the Israelites. So it is, that only in the church do we have the light of the knowledge of God. Those who live without the church pass from the dense shades of ignorance in this present life into the darkness of eternal condemnation in the life that is to come. He who has no portion in the church militant upon earth shall never share in the glories of the church triumphant above. For there is the closest union between these, God, the Word, faith, Christ, the Church, and life eternal. The Holy Church of God sustains the relations of mother, virgin, 
bride. She is as a mother, because she daily bears spiritual sons to God. She is as a chaste virgin, because she keeps herself pure from all unholy alliances with the devil and the world. She is a bride, because Christ hath betrothed her to himself by an eternal covenant, and hath given to her the pledge of the Spirit. The church is that ship which carries Christ and his disciples, and which will bear us, finally, into the haven of eternal blessedness. The church thus sails in a blessed course over the sea of this world, furnished with faith as a rudder, having God for her pilot, angels for her oarsmen, and all the company of the godly for her passengers. On her deck is erected the cross of our salvation as her mast, upon which are suspended the sails of evangelical faith, and with these, filled with the breezes of the Holy Spirit, she is conducted to the haven of eternal rest. The church is that vine which God hath planted in the field of this world, which he hath watered with his own blood, which he hath hedged around with the protecting influences of holy angels, in which he hath digged the winepress of his own bitter passion, from which he hath removed the stones, and whatsoever might offend. The church is that woman clothed with the sun, because she is arrayed in the righteousness of Christ. She treads the moon under her feet, because she looks down upon earthly things as subject to various change and decay. Contemplate, O devout soul, the exalted dignity of the church, and render due thanks, therefore, to Almighty God. Great indeed are the blessings which God bestows upon us in and through the church, but these are not open to us all. In a sense, it is as a garden enclosed, as a fountain sealed. No one may behold the beauty of such an enclosed garden without entering it, so no one can know of the blessings that God gives through his church except those who are actually in it. This bride of Christ is black without, but comely within. For the king's daughter is all glorious within. This ship is tossed about with various tempests of persecution. This vine is sustained in an upright position by being bound to supports, and it is pruned that it may bring forth more fruit. And for this woman the infernal dragon himself lies in wait with hellish snares. Beautiful as a lily is the church, but it is as a lily among thorns. A most beautiful garden is the church, but when the keen blasts of tribulation blow through it, then only do its precious spices flow out. The church is the daughter of God, but she is greatly despised by the world. She looks forward expectantly to a heavenly inheritance, and for this reason she wanders as a stranger and pilgrim upon the earth. In her wanderings she is oppressed, and yet in her oppression she is silent, and in her silence is brave, and by her bravery she overcomes all her enemies. The church is our spiritual mother, and yet, like Mary, the mother of Christ, she must stand weeping at the cross of our Saviour. The church is like a palm tree, and that the heavier her burden of tribulation and temptations, the more she grows. Meditate, O devout soul, upon the worthiness of the church, and take heed, lest thou do anything unworthy of her. The church is thy spiritual mother. Take care that thou despise not her voice as she speaks to thee. She is thy mother, and through word and sacraments thou oughtest draw all thy spiritual nourishment from her. The church is as a chaste virgin. If thou then wouldest be true to her, abstain from the embraces of the world. Thou belongest to her, see then, that thou dishonour not thyself nor her, by any unholy alliances with the devil. The church is the bride of Christ, and so is every godly soul. Let it take heed then, not to cling to Satan in an unholy union. Thou, O my soul, art the bride of Christ. See to it that thou lose not the earnest of the Holy Spirit, which hath been given unto thee. Thou art the bride of Christ. Pray unceasingly, that thy heavenly bridegroom may hasten to lead thee unto the marriage feast above. Thy bridegroom may come in the quiet and security of the midnight hour. Watch, therefore, that when he cometh he may not find thee sleeping, and shut the door of eternal salvation upon thee. Let thy lamp be filled with the oil of faith, and be brightly burning, lest at the coming of thy heavenly spouse thou shouldest seek in vain for oil for thy lamp. 
thou art born in the church as in a ship o take heed lest thou cast thyself into the raging sea of the world before ever thou comest into the heavenly port o pray earnestly that thou mayest not be engulfed by storms of affliction and waves of temptation thou art called into the vineyard of thy lord o labour earnestly faithfully let the thought of the reward at the close of the day lighten all thy toil thou o my soul art a vine of thy lord's own planting cast away from thee then all useless branches all the fruitless works of the flesh and look upon the whole course of thy life here upon earth as a time for pruning to make thee more fruitful thou art a branch in the true vine christ jesus o oh, see to it that thou abidest in christ and bearest much fruit for the heavenly husbandman taketh away the branch that beareth not fruit and purgeth the branch that beareth fruit that it might bring forth more fruit thou hast put on christ through faith and art clothed with this sun of righteousness see to it then that thou trample under thy feet the moon that is all things that are earthly in their nature and that thou esteemest these of little value in comparison with the eternal comforts of heaven o blessed jesus who has led us into thy church militant upon earth bring us at last in thy mercy into thy church triumphant in heaven end of meditation 23Meditation 24 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Predestination. We are chosen in Christ. O devout soul, as often as thou wouldest meditate upon thy predestination, look up to Christ hanging upon the cross, dying there for the sins of the whole world, and rising again for our justification. Let thy meditation begin with the infant Redeemer as he lay in the manger, and so let it proceed in regular order to the end. God hath chosen us before the foundation of the world, but that choice was made in Christ. If, therefore, thou art in Christ by faith, doubt not that this election of grace pertains to thee also. If thou art clinging to Christ with firm and assured confidence of heart, let no doubts distress thee as to thy being included in the number of the elect. But if, passing beyond the limits of the word of God, thou desirest to pry into the profound mystery of predestination a priori, or by the light of reason alone, it is to be greatly feared that thou wilt fall into the depths of despair. Out of Christ God is a consuming fire. Take heed, therefore, lest thou presumptuously approach too near this fire and be consumed. Without the satisfaction rendered by Christ as our Saviour, God accuses us all by the words of the law, I condemns us all. Take good heed, then, that thou seekest not to solve the mystery of thy predestination from the law. Seek not to fathom all the reasons of the divine counsels, nor to penetrate all the secret counsels of the Most High, lest thy thoughts lead thee far away from God. God dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. Presume not, then, to approach him rashly and without due humility. And yet God hath revealed himself most graciously to us in the light of the gospel. In this light thou mayest safely inquire concerning the mystery of thy election, and in this light thou wilt see the true light. Leave, then, the consideration of the profound mysteries of that eternal decree made from all eternity and turn thy thought to the clear manifestations of God's will and purpose concerning thee made in time through Christ. Our justification in Christ made in time is a mirror or clear exhibition to us of God's purpose of election made without time. See from the law how justly God's wrath is expressed against thy sins, and repent thereof. See from the gospel how graciously God's mercy is extended to thee because of Christ's merit, and by faith make it thine own. Comprehend the true nature of faith, and exhibit it in thy godly conversation. Recognize in thy cross the fatherly chastisements of God, and bear it with patience. And then at length thou mayest begin to discuss the doctrine of predestination. 
The Apostle pursues this method. Let the true disciple of the Apostle follow it also. In respect of this mystery, three things are always to be observed. The mercy of God who loves us, the merit of Christ who suffers for us, and the grace of the Holy Spirit who calls us through the gospel. The mercy of God is all-embracing, because he loved the whole world. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Aye, it is greater than heaven and earth. It is infinite as God is, because God is love. He solemnly declares in his own word that he has no pleasure in the death of any one. As if this were not enough, he confirmed it with an oath. If thou canst not believe when God promises, at least believe him when he makes a solemn oath concerning thy salvation. God is called the Father of mercies, because it is his very nature to be merciful and to pardon. His property of showing mercy he derives from himself. It is his own nature. But his property of judging and taking vengeance he seems to derive from another. It seems to be foreign to his nature. So much more disposed does he seem to be to show mercy than vengeance. The merit of Christ is also universal, because he suffered for the sins of the whole world. What can demonstrate more clearly the mercy of God towards us than that he loved us before we had any being, because it was solely of his love that we were created? He loved us even when we were his enemies, since it was simply of his love that he gave his Son to redeem us. To the sinner condemned to eternal torment, and utterly unable to redeem himself, God says, Here is my only begotten Son, take him and offer him for thy ransom. The Son himself says, Here am I, take me, crucify me, and redeem thyself. Christ is the flower of the open plain, not of the enclosed garden, because the odor of his grace is not limited to a few, but freely belongs to all. And that thou mightest have no doubt that his merit is for all, Christ mercifully prayed in the hour of his death for the very men who were crucifying him, and shed his own blood for those who were then really shedding his blood. The promises of the gospel are also universal, for Christ says unto all, Come unto me, all ye that labor. What was performed and provided for all is freely offered to all. And of all those things which thy Saviour hath accomplished for thee by his redemption, and now offers thee, thou mayest enjoy just as much as thy faith will accept. God denies the blessing of his grace to none but those who deem themselves unworthy of it, and thus refuse it. Consider then, O faithful soul, these three supports of the fact of thine election, and upon them rest with a firm and hearty confidence. Consider the tender mercy of thy God exhibited to thee in the past, and doubt not concerning its continuance to the end. When as yet thou hadst no being, God created thee. When through Adam's fall thou wast condemned to eternal death, he redeemed thee. When out of the church thou didst live in the world, he called thee. When thou wast ignorant, he instructed thee. When thou didst wander away, he led thee back again. When thou didst sin, he corrected thee. When thou stoodest, he held thee fast. When thou didst fall down, he raised thee up again. When thou didst go forward, he led thee. When thou camest to him, he received thee. In all this, he showed his long suffering in waiting for thee, and his readiness to pardon thee. The mercy of God goeth before thee. Hope firmly that it will also follow thee. The mercy of God anticipates thee to heal thee of the malady of thy sin. It will follow thee also to glorify thee. It anticipates thee that thou mayest be enabled to live a godly life. It will follow thee that thou mayest live with him for ever. Why art thou not crushed when thou fallest? Who puts thy hand under thee to stay thee? Who but the Lord? Trust then in the mercy of thy God in the future, and firmly hope for the end of thy faith even the salvation of thy soul. In whose hands canst thou most securely and confidently rest the matter of thy salvation than in those which form the heavens and the earth, in those which are never shortened that they cannot save, in those from which flow forth streams of compassion, 
nor are ever wanting in courses through which to flow. Consider then, O devout soul, that we are chosen of God, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The blessings of election belong not to those, therefore, who desire not and strive not for a holy life. We are chosen in Christ. We are in Christ by faith, and faith worketh by love. Where, therefore, love is absent, faith cannot be present. And where faith is absent, Christ cannot be. Where Christ is absent, there is no election. The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. No one shall ever pluck Christ's sheep out of his hands, but then Christ's sheep hear his voice. We are the house of God, but let us hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. O Lord, do thou who hast given me to will, give me power also to perform. End of Meditation 24Meditation 25 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Saving Efficacy of Prayer Our sighs pierce the heavens. It is a mark of great favor on the part of God that he desires the godly to approach him in prayer in the spirit of familiar friendship. He gives us the disposition to pray and likewise makes our prayers effectual. Great indeed is the power of prayer, which, though it be offered upon the earth, is effectual in heaven. The prayer of a righteous man is the key to the treasury of heaven. The request ascends to heaven, and the answer of pardon and peace descends from God. Prayer is a shield of safety to the believer, quenching all the darts of the adversary. When Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed against the Amalekites. And if thou hold up thy hands toward heaven in prayer, Satan shall not prevail against thee. As a massive wall resists and opposes the advance of an enemy, so is the holy wrath of God averted by the prayers of his saints. Our Saviour himself prayed, not for the supply of his own necessities, but to teach us the worth and dignity of prayer. Prayer is a mark of our subjection, because God bids us offer prayers to him daily as a sort of spiritual tribute to him. It is a ladder by which we ascend to heaven, for prayer is nothing else than a drawing near of the mind of God. It is a shield of defense, because the soul that liveth daily in a spirit of prayer is secure from the insults of devils. Prayer is a faithful messenger we send to the throne of God, to call him to our aid in the time of need. This messenger is never frustrated in his embassy, for God always hears us when we pray, if not according to our desires, yet according to our profit and salvation. We may without doubt or peradventure hope for one of two things, either that God will give us just what we ask for, or that he will grant us that which he knows is more profitable for us. God, unasked, hath given us the most excellent gift that he had to bestow, even his own Son. What, then, will he not give us when we supplicate his throne? We must not doubt either God's readiness to hear our prayers, nor our Saviour's active intercession in our behalf. Under any circumstances whatever, thou mayest, with Moses, enter the tabernacle to take counsel with the Lord in prayer, and quickly wilt thou hear the divine response. When Christ prayed, he was transfigured, and so prayer transforms and transfigures our souls. For prayer is as a light to the soul, which very frequently leaves him exulting with joy, whom it found cast down with despondency. How canst thou look upon the sun, unless thou hast first adored him who gives thee its beneficent light? How canst thou enjoy the bounties of thy table, unless thou hast first given thanks to him who so abundantly supplies the good things of life. With what hope canst thou resign thyself to the slumbers of the night, if thou hast not first fortified thyself with prayer? What fruit canst thou expect from thy labors, if thou dost not first invoke the blessing of God upon them, 
without whom all labor must be fruitless. If, therefore, thou desirest spiritual and temporal gifts, ask, and thou shalt receive. If thou desirest Christ, seek him in prayer, and thou shalt find him. If thou desirest the door of divine grace and eternal salvation opened, knock through prayer, and it shall be opened to thee. If in thy pilgrimage through this wilderness world thou art afflicted with spiritual thirst, through temptation and a lack of spiritual blessings, come thou in thy devotions to the spiritual rock, that is, Christ, and strike it with the rod of prayer, and streams of divine grace shall flow forth to quench thy thirst and supply thy need. Dost thou wish to offer a pleasing sacrifice to God? Offer prayer. The Lord will receive the sweet odor of thy sacrifice, and his wrath will abate. Wouldst thou hold constant intercourse with God? Take delight in prayer, for this is spiritual conversation between God and the devout soul. Wouldst thou taste and see that the Lord is good? Then constrain the Lord by prayer to take up his abode in thy heart. Prayer is pleasing to God, but only when offered in his appointed way. If, therefore, thou wouldest be heard in prayer, pray wisely, ardently, humbly, faithfully, perseveringly, and confidently. Pray wisely, that is, for those things that may be for the glory of God and the salvation of thy fellow man. God is almighty. Do not strive, therefore, in thy prayer to limit or restrict his power. He is all-wise. Do not then prescribe any set order in which thy prayer should be answered. Be not rash or presumptuous in thy prayers, but let them issue from a heart full of faith. Faith, however, hath due regard to the divine word. What God promises absolutely in his word, that thou mayest pray for absolutely. What he promises conditionally, as for example temporal blessings, those likewise thou shouldest ask for conditionally. What he has in no way promised thou shouldest in no way pray for. Often God gives us in holy wrath what he denies us in mercy. Therefore follow the example of Christ, who fully yields his own will to God. Pray ardently, for how canst thou ask God to hear thee when thou dost not hear thyself? Wouldest thou have God mindful of thee when thou art not mindful of thyself? When thou wouldest pray, enter thy closet and close the door. Thy heart is that closet unto which thou shouldest enter if thou wouldest rightly pray. Thou must close the door, that the distracting thoughts of worldly affairs enter not in to disturb thee. There are no voices that will reach the ears of God, but the deep emotions of the soul. The mind ought to be stirred by the ardor of our meditations, that it will far exceed what the tongue expresses. This is to pray in spirit and in truth, as our Lord requires. Christ prayed on a mountain and lifted up his eyes to heaven. And so ought we to turn our minds away from all creatures, and direct them to God. Thou doest God an injury, if thou prayest him to have regard to thee, when thou hast none to thyself. We can pray without ceasing, if we pray in the Spirit, so that at least our mind is always watchful towards God in holy desires. It is not needful that we should supplicate God with loud cries, because as he dwells in the hearts of the godly, he hears the very sighs of our hearts. Nor need we multiply words in our prayers, for he knoweth our thoughts. Sometimes a single groan under the impulse of the Spirit of God, and offered up in the power of that Spirit, is more pleasing to God than a long and tedious repetition of prayers, where the tongue speaks, but the heart is altogether silent. Pray humbly, trusting not in thy own merit, but only in the grace of God. If our prayers are offered in reliance upon our own worthiness, they are condemned in God's sight, although in the ardor of devotion our hearts might sweat blood. No one can do that which is pleasing to God except in Christ, and no one can pray acceptably but in the name of Christ and relying upon his merit. No sacrifices were acceptable to God, but those offered on the altar of God's appointed tabernacle alone. And no prayer can be offered acceptably to God, but on that altar of his appointment, Christ Jesus. 
the Lord promised to hear the prayers of Israel if they prayed with their faces toward Jerusalem. So in our prayers, let us turn ourselves towards Christ, who is indeed the temple of the Godhead. When Christ prayed in Gethsemane, he cast himself down upon the ground. Behold how that most holy soul humbles himself in the presence of the divine majesty. Pray faithfully, so that thou mightest rightly bear the deprivation of every joy, and patiently endure every chastisement. The sooner we pray the better for us, the more frequently we offer up our devotions, the more profitable it will be. The more fervently we approach to God, the more acceptable shall our prayers be to Him. Pray perseveringly, because when God delays the answer, He is not always denying us, but simply commending His gifts. And those gifts that we have desired for a long time we relish more keenly when we obtain them. Pray confidently, asking truly in faith, nothing wavering. O most merciful, indulgent God, who hast bidden us to come to thee in prayer, help us to pray acceptably unto thee. End of Meditation 25「Meditation 26 of Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhardt, translated by C. W. Heisler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Guardianship of Angels Saints have their guardian angels. Consider, O devout soul, the grace of thy God in giving his angels charge concerning thee. Our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world to deliver us from our sins. The Son of God Himself became incarnate for our salvation. The Holy Spirit is sent to sanctify us. Angels are dispatched from heaven to protect us. Thus the whole assembly of heaven is employed to serve us and to make their blessings ours. I no longer wonder that all the inferior creatures of earth are formed for man, since even the angels of heaven, so much more exalted than we, deny us not their gentle ministries. What wonder and that the heavens give us light by day, that we may labor in darkness by night, that we may rest, since the dwellers in that heavenly kingdom are busy in holy service to us. What wonder is it that the air furnishes us with the breath of life and all sorts of fowls for our indulgence, when those heavenly spirits watch over us to preserve our lives from harm? What wonder that the water should quench our thirst, cleanse away filth, refresh the arid land, and teem with various kinds of fish for us, when the holy angels themselves stand by us to refresh and comfort us when we are wearied with the hot breath of troubles and temptation. What wonder that the earth gives thee an abode, and for thy nourishment furnishes thy table with all kinds of creature comforts, when he giveth his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways, to bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. The angels were deeply interested in the early life of Christ. An angel announced his conception. An angel joyfully heralds his birth. An angel gives command for the flight into Egypt. Angels minister to him in the wilderness. Angels wait upon him during all his earthly ministry. An angel is present with him in the awful agony of death. An angel appears at his resurrection. Angels were present at his glorious ascension and angels will accompany him when he returns to judgment. As therefore angels ministered to Christ in the days of his flesh, so likewise are they deeply interested in all those who through faith are incorporated into Christ. As they ministered to the glorious head, in the same manner shall they minister to the members of the body of Christ. They joyfully serve upon earth those whom they shall have by and by as companions in heaven, nor refuse their holy ministries to those whose delightful fellowship they hope to enjoy after a while. As Jacob went on his way to his native land, the angels of God met him. So angelic guards attend the righteous in this life, which is the pathway to their heavenly fatherland. Angels appear to protect Daniel among the lions. So they ever stand ready to protect the godly from the snares of the lion of hell. Angels hasten the patriarch Lot from the destruction that was to overtake Sodom. 
So, by their holy inspirations and their protecting influences against the temptations of the devil, they frequently snatch us as from the very flames of the pit. Angels carry Lazarus into the bosom of Abraham. So do they bear the souls of all God's chosen ones to the glorious palace of the heavenly king. It was an angel that led the apostle Peter out of prison, and so our angel often delivers us from most distressing perils. Great indeed is the power of the adversary the devil, but it cheers us to reflect that the angel guards attend us. Doubt not that in all thy dangers these heavenly helpers are near thee, for the scriptures, under the figure of cherubim and seraphim, represent them as winged, to assure us that in every time of peril they will, with incredible swiftness, bring us the needed aid. Doubt not that the guardian angels are present with thee in all places, for they are the purest spirits, unencumbered with material bodies. All visible things yield it to them, and hither and thither at will they go unhindered. Nor needest thou doubt that these spirits know thy perils and afflictions, for they always behold the face of the heavenly Father, and stand always ready most promptly to do his will. Consider, O devout soul, that these angels are holy. Strive, then, after holiness, if thou wouldest enjoy their blessed fellowship. Similarity of character is especially favorable to friendship. Accustom thyself to holy deeds, if thou wouldst have their guardianship. Everywhere show due reverence to thine angel, and never do anything in his presence thou wouldst blush to do in the sight of men. These angelic spirits are chaste and pure, and therefore are driven away by impurity in thought and deed. As foul smoke drives away bees, so these angelic guardians of our lives are put to flight by foul and grievous sin. And, having once lost their protecting power, how wilt thou be safe from the snares of the devil, or the various perils that may beset thee? If thy soul is left without strong wall of angelic defense, then the devil will easily storm it by his artful devices. These holy angels are sent forth as ministering spirits by God himself, Hence thou must be reconciled to God through faith in Christ, if thou wouldst enjoy their guardianship. If thou hast not the grace of God in thine heart, thou needest not expect angels to guard thee. Let us look upon the angel as, in a sense, the serviceable hands of God, which move themselves to no purpose unless he direct them. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. The tears of truly penitent sinners are as wine to the angels, while the hard and impenitent heart drives away these heavenly guardians. Let us then manifest penitence for our sins, that we may excite joy among the angels of God. Angels are of a heavenly and spiritual nature. Therefore, let us fix our thoughts upon those things that are heavenly and spiritual, that they may delight to dwell with us. The angels are marked by their humility, and pride is exceedingly hateful to those who disdain not to serve little children. Why then should we, who are but as dust and ashes, exhibit such pride when a heavenly spirit humbles itself so greatly? The cunning of the evil one is most to be feared in the hour of death, for it is written that the serpent shall bruise the heel. The last part of the body is the heel. The last part of life is death. In the last agony of death will we stand most in need of the guardianship of angels, who shall deliver us from the fiery darts of the devil, and shall transport our souls as they depart from the home of the body to the heavenly paradise. When Zacharias was executing the priest's office in the sacred courts of the temple, the angel of the Lord came to him. So, if thou dost rejoice in the use of God's word, and in the exercise of thy devotions, thou too shalt rejoice in the blessed ministry of angels. O most merciful God, who by thy holy angels has led us through this wilderness, grant that through them also we may be led into the glory of thy heavenly kingdom.
End of Meditation 26